All right, guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tee that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tee that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star T, I I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically just pop the pad on the bar, reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. Time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Joe Jordan. Joe has been with Team Elite FTS since 2006 or 2007, somewhere Mm -hmm. around that time period. Um, Been competing for close to two decades. About 27 years. 27 years, so three decades. If I actually did the math yeah. in like the 2005, <laughs> but I am going to ask when the first meet was, cause I don't think it's what's listed on open okay. powerlifting. No, it's not. Um, the multi-ply, there's all kinds of records. So all I'm going to say is in the all time top 10, 275 masters, you're in the top 10 for the 40, 44 mm-hmm. and 45 to 49. Yes, sir. As far as multi-ply overall, it's 59. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yep. And then the best lifts at 242 are 970, 650, 720, Mm -hmm. 275, 1025, 680, and 710. Yes, sir. Married for 27 years. Yes, sir. Three kids. Yes, sir. One of them's already out of the house. Yeah, she's living in uh, Roanoke, Virginia now. And the other one's close. She's uh, she's out. She's still living in the uh, in Daytona area, but yeah, she's out living with her boyfriend. Then your youngest is 14. Right. So you're almost an empty nester so we're gonna have to speak about that yeah i'm not looking forward to that at all <laughs> so i would just you know summarize it by saying power lifter father and husband yes sir. be a good way to do that um when we get into your history and your timeline you were an army brat growing up right yes sir when when did you start just lifting weights in general started when i was 12 years old uh my uncle actually got me into it because i was getting uh, i was playing football Obviously, that's how a lot of us get started in our lifting. And uh, just, he was a big dude, and I wanted to be a big dude. You know, I got picked on and shit because of, like, the scars on my head and my hair and acne and shit like that. So it was just something to get bigger, to play football, and to just keep people from fucking with me. So when you were moving around, how frequently was that? Every two to four years, we would move. I remember, I forget what year it was. I think I was in fourth grade. I went to like two or three different schools in one year. Yeah. Cause we, we were still in the same area, but we kept, we like, we started off in one, one part and then we moved on base. So I had to go to a different school. So yeah, it was like two or two schools in one year. So when you were training, then it was just for football and sports or just, yeah, just football. And sports. Did you like at that point at that, say as a teenager, did you like the training more than the sport? I think so. I mean, I, I enjoyed football because I mean, it, and baseball because it was just it was fun and football i enjoyed it because we got to hit hit people you yeah know, without any repercussions uh but yeah i i always i always enjoyed training because i wanted to be like those dudes in the magazine mm-hmm. you know i wanted to be big and veiny and shit so i i really enjoyed myself in the gym uh just, just because it's just you man yeah you know i enjoyed doing like I, I wasn't much into legs then because it was all you know it was like beach muscle mm-hmm. so like we did a whole bunch of bench presses and curls and shit like that now, where were your station or where was your, where were your parents? Was it your father? Yeah, it was, it was my dad. A, where was your dad stationed when you were in high school? Uh, let's see. This, the, when I started, it was like North Carolina. So it's Fort Bragg, which is, I guess is now Fort Liberty. Uh, so I was there. And then from there, we moved over to Germany. Um, and that's where I did a lot of, like, we were there for four years. So I trained on base there. So I guess that's where I did most of my stuff or growing up. And then uh, from there, we moved to El Paso 
which was Fort Bliss for my last two years of high school. Um, so that's, that's whenever there was more uh, guidance as mm-hmm. far as concerned. It was like for weight training because we actually had a coach that did weight training. So it wasn't just like I come in and bench one day and then arms the next, and mm-hmm. you know, that's all we ever did. So I had more guidance then whenever I was, uh, when I got to El Paso. Did you go straight to college from high school or was there a gap? No, I, I went straight. I went uh, from there uh, right out of high school, moved to Troy, Alabama. I went to Troy State University. I uh, tried to walk on the baseball team there, and then I realized that uh, – what I was in high school was not good enough for what, yeah. what they expected in college. So yeah, I was spent a couple of years at Troy State and then moved to uh, University of Florida, uh, where my wife was and finished out there. Now during that time, were you still training, weight training? Yes. General? When did powerlifting enter the picture? Nineteen ninety-seven is whenever I did my first powerlifting meet. So was that while you were in college or before that? It was just after I graduated. Okay. So. If I could backtrack, when, yeah, I was at, yeah. when I was at Troy State, uh, there was a gym that I trained out. It's not there anymore, but it's called Iron Horse. And it was owned by a guy that was a bench press specialist. So that was my introduction to powerlifting because I didn't know what it was until mm-hmm. then. So I would see him train in the way that he trained. So it was, it was interesting because it was, you know, you're, you're not training to be big, but you're training to be strong. And I liked that idea because I realized I wasn't going to be a bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. For one, I didn't have the discipline to sit you know, eat fucking potatoes and rice and chicken all the time because I enjoyed pizza and carbs and everything. Excuse me. So that was my introduction to powerlifting. So I didn't really start training for it until, um, I guess, my senior year of high school or senior year of college is whenever I started getting more into it and decided to do uh, a powerlifting meet. So I had no guidance. I didn't know any powerlifters or anything like that. So I got a uh, powerlifting USA. And I found a training program that was, I think his name was Chris Confessor. Mm-hmm. Confessor. Okay. Yeah. So like, that's what I found. So that's what I followed for this meet. So again, I'm going to work out of the month things yes, where you would exactly. convert, pull out the calculator. Yep. Yeah. So like, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I was training at a uh, powerhouse gym that was in Castleberry, Florida. It was owned by Andre Reed, who used to play for the Bills. So like I was the only dude in there doing powerlifting movements. You know, I was the only one deadlifting and squatting heavy and shit like that. So that was that was the first meet that I did was 1997. It wasn't it wasn't a uh, what do you call it? So it wasn't with any federation. Mm-hmm. It was uh, it was just by itself. It was through Orange County Parks and Recreation that I worked with. So like I didn't know the rules or regulations of it. So I just tra- I just came and did what I did at the gym yeah and i looked like a fucking idiot because like uh i used to this is how we did it at the gym we would wrap towels around the bar to fucking squat with yeah because that was before i knew Mm -hmm. don't be a vagina so like i I get up there and it was my turn to squat and i wrap a towel around the bar and nobody said a damn thing to me they just let me do it so that's how i did all three attempts and then in the meat yeah at the meat (laughs) You know, that's what I mean. Like, <laughs> it, it was unsanctioned. So that's the word I was working. It was unsanctioned. Nobody said anything. Nobody said a damn thing to me. Like, <laughs> nobody was like, hey, dude, you can't do that. They just let me do it. Mm-hmm. And then that followed onto the bench, uh, the Versa grips. I wore <laughs> Versa grips to fucking bench with. So, I, like I said, I didn't know the rules. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they just let me do it. And then they let me wear the Versa grips for deadlifting, too. Oh, no shit. No shit. So, that I'd like, oh, well, this is how it's done. Mm-hmm. And then finally, after the meet, they come up to me and tell me after the meet. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you probably shouldn't, you're not supposed to be doing these things. I'm like, well, why, why didn't you tell me beforehand? So I didn't look like an idiot in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was also my introduction to equipment because that I'm at the meet and I see guys putting on these, what, the EDHPD, yeah. the ends of like blast shirts the and shit. Thing. Yeah. yeah. So I see these guys putting on these bench shirts and I'm like, I'm like, Hit my wife. I'm like, look, look at this shit. I'm like, what the fuck is that? So I was, I was like, this is, this is cool. Mm-hmm. I, I want to lift more weight. So that was my introduction to that. So that's uh, so 97 unsanctioned meet. I think I s- squatted and pulled 410 or 420, and I, I benched 310. What do you think? You know, what was the weight class? 220 at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then after that meet, how did you feel? I mean, obviously you kept continuing to do oh, it, yeah. but hungrier, I assume. It, it like I, it was because the, the guy that beat me didn't beat me by much. And I'm a very competitive person. 
So I, I wanted to come back and do it again the next year and, uh, and beat this dude. Cause he was, he was older than me, bigger than me, shit mm-hmm. like that. So, yeah. So I, I started getting more powerlifting USAs, reading more articles, you know, trying to learn more about West side and the conjugate program and stuff. I never did a real good job of that. It was very confusing to me. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of lit the fire, um, to kind of get into powerlifting, but then it kind of took us, it took a side track because my wife ended up going to school in the Caribbean in St. Kitts. She went to veterinary school down there and I, uh, I moved down there with her cause they, they had this, uh, this is a whole different story. They mm-hmm. had this, they had a guy on the Island who was wanted by the U S government because yeah, he was a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. So he was from Miami. His, his nickname was little nut, but he, yeah, fucking idiot. <laughs> But they called him that because he was fucking psycho. So when he was in Miami, he killed a bunch of people, but then he fled back to to St. Kitts. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. government was trying to get him extradited. Well, this guy told them, if you try to extradite me, I'm going to start killing American students. So I moved down there so that I could be with her, and I would go with her and other students everywhere they went. Now, I wasn't that big. It was like 230, 240 Mm -hmm. at the time. But compared to the majority of the people on that island, I was a big dude. So, like, I would walk with them everywhere they went um, to restaurants, movies, and shit like that just because this guy was threatening students. Uh, they did finally end up extraditing him, and, like, nothing happened or anything. But I ended up spending the next two years there with her as a, as a librarian at the veterinary school. Any training at all? Yes. But it was, it was an old-school gym because uh, it's on the island. Uh, I forget the name of the gym, but they had everything that I needed. It, um, I, there's no air conditioning or anything like that. So whenever it rained, it was like they had like barn doors. They would close down. So it got really fucking humid. Mm-hmm. But they had everything. They had, you know, heavy dumbbells. They had squat racks, you know, uh, benches and stuff like that. So uh, they did end up having a meet on that island before I, uh, before I left. But the guy, the guy that owned the gym, his name was Truss, and he didn't want me doing the meet against the locals there. So like, he kept pushing the meet off to the point where it finally fell on a time where like, the students were on break and I wasn't gonna be on the island because we were going to another place. Um, so he held the meet on that weekend so that I wouldn't be able to compete. What was his logic for not having you being able to compete? I don't think he liked the idea that I was gonna be stronger than the lifters or the people that were training at his gym. Mm-hmm. Um, granted I wasn't, I wasn't super strong, you know, uh, but I just trained differently than they did, mm-hmm. you know? So like, so my methods were showing benefits and I was getting stronger faster than they were. Plus I used like knee wraps and stuff like that. And they didn't have any idea what knee wraps were. Um, so he, he just didn't, I, and I, I'm not sure that this was it, but this is the, the feeling that I got is mm-hmm. that he didn't want me doing the meet. Mm-hmm. So what I did was like, I did a mock meet beforehand in like, knew what I, what I could have done. And then, you know, I compared that to the numbers of the guys that did it at the meet and I would have, I would have won, you know, not to toot my own horn or anything. Cause it wasn't anything, you know, so would that be 90, it was eight, 99, it was 99, 99, 2000. Mm-hmm. So like, I think I squatted five and benched like three sixty, And then I forget what I pulled. I've never been a very good death. Yeah. Before. Then where did you guys come back to uh, Georgia? And Georgia's where I, uh, like we were in Athens at UGA where my wife was doing her, um, her, what we call it, uh, clinical rotations there. And that's where I met, uh, LB Baker. Um, and LB kind of, uh, he gave me more information or helped me with powerlifting, uh, what federations to do. Um, that's, that's also like, I saw APF. That's what I was doing there in Georgia. And that's where I met like Steve Goggins and stuff. Mm-hmm. Not really met him, but got to see him and like see these guys that like, show up to these meets. And I was like flabbergasted. And I'm like, I want to be like these dudes because mm-hmm. they're big as shit. So that was like, that's whenever I really got into powerlifting and decided this is what I want to do just by watching these guys and being be able to do these meets with these guys and like spotting and loading and stuff. Now with LB Baker, was that a crew that you were training with? Yeah, it was a, it was a small crew. It was a very small group. It was like Georgia, uh, UGA powerlifting. Um, so it, it wasn't a whole lot of people there. Uh, like there was one dude I can remember his name was Ben Howard and I don't remember, I don't know what he's doing now, but like we would train at LB's house sometimes, you know, stuff like that. So like, that's another, like, he's also what introduced, helped me get more into gear, 
you know, and trying to understand what it is and how to use it and stuff like that. How long were you there? Just, uh, just a year. It wasn't very long. Mm -hmm. So after that, like we moved from Athens after a year, we moved to Orlando because my wife had a job lined up after medical school to go to school there, or I'm sorry, to, uh, to work there at one of the, uh, vet veterinary hospitals. So, uh, once we got there, uh, I trained at a, a gym called Steel Mill, which is where I met my two uh, powerlifting buddies that actually, I guess, helped me or showed me the ropes as far as powerlifting. So they, they, we learned about bands and squat suits and deadlift suits and shit like that. So they were much more, um, much more information based or helped me learn more than what I was learning before. Was this conjugate based or more linear based? Uh, probably linear at the time. Um, cause like we were still trying to learn we, this, is the, this is the first time I saw a monolith too. Yeah. So we were trying to learn the aspects of it and like, uh, Ronnie Paris and Dutch flesh were the guys that I was training with. And like, so we were trying to learn how to use bands and we had this big argument about how to set them up. Like they're setting them up to where they like, was completely deloading at the bottom. Like guys, there's something wrong with this. It shouldn't be just falling off like that. Mm -hmm. So like I, I ended up having to go on to, um, the West side website and find the band article and like to argue with them and say this is how it's supposed to be set up so like that so that was my introduction to bands like we were doing it wrong for like weeks and i'm like i don't think this is how it's supposed to be done mm -hmm. you know um didn't i didn't know how to use my squat suit like i was narrow you know with a suit on still squatting with knees forward and stuff i wasn't sitting into the gear and stuff like that so uh that's whenever we met um brian tincher Mm -hmm. who was a uh, co-owner of Orlando Barbell with Brian Schwab. So after Schwab opened the gym, this is whenever my powerlifting career kind of took off because the gym was two minutes from my house. So I, uh, as, soon as, as soon as Brian opened up the gym, um, I think it was like two, three weeks later, I went and joined the gym. So that's whenever I started getting trained with Brian. And Brian uh, obviously understood shit a lot better than I did. Uh, so basically I have him to thank for getting me started like all wrong, along the right path and helping him, helping me get to where I am now. Yeah. Cause, uh, he taught me about squatting in gear and benching in a shirt, uh, cause we were benching in denim then, you know, and Schwab, I know <laughs> fucking denim and Schwab, Schwab's like a fucking king in benching in denim. He was yeah. getting like 300 pounds out of a goddamn denim shirt, you know? So like most of us were lucky to get like 150, 200 pounds and this guy's getting 300. Yeah. So, I mean, I couldn't help but listen to him. So, um, so training with him, learning from him about conjugate and linear and like his minimalist methods, uh, chains, bands, rack pulls, just so that's where everything kind of like came together and I started making a lot better progress. You were there for about a decade, right? It was 14, 15, 14 years, I think I trained there at, at, at OVB. How long when you first came in? Because a crew obviously develops mm -hmm. <clears throat> how long did the crew stay together i mean what was wow because the people always are in and out yeah but it, there's usually a core is especially there because we're a college town if you will yeah so a lot of the guys that were on the on the team uh you know would age out or graduate out and move on or like lives would happen they get married or have kids so it was probably a good four to five years. We had a very a core group that would um, we'd bench together on fr on Saturdays, and then we'd go out and eat together after that. And I fucking loved it. Like there was, like we there's sometimes like we'd have twelve and fifteen guys benching, and this is whenever we had one bench. So like these training sessions would take four hours just to get us. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So then we'd all go out and hang out together, and that was that was amazing to me because it was the team aspect. You know, we were all very supportive in the gym and out of the gym. We hung out. We knew each other's families. We hung out with each other. And then on, and then like Sunday mornings, my group would uh, come in and squat. So we'd do max effort bench on Saturday and then max effort squat on Sundays. So like some of the guys would come in fucking hung over to squat yeah, on Sunday yeah. mornings. And that was always entertaining. Um, but yeah, there was probably about four or five years. We had a, we had a, a group um, where we, we basically did everything together. You know, we had a, uh, man, I, I, those were the times I really, really enjoyed because it was, it was, it was fun. What did your lifts do during that time period, those four to five years? Um, let's see, probably, I think the 
the first meet I did was in Maine. Like I did an AAPF nationals and I bombed. Uh, so I think I bent, went from like a 700 pound squat to like a, a 900 pound squat in like those five years. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause that was like, whenever I came on to the team it was like in 2007, I think it was. So then I think in my first meet with elite FTS, I did the, uh, the, uh, Lex and pro-am. So I, I think that was whenever I squatted like 970 and bench 650 and pulled seven something. So that was like, so that was like, yeah, seven, six or seven years into me being at, at, uh, at OBB. What year would that be? I think it was, uh, 2006, 2007. I got two pages in me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was like, and at the time whenever I squat, so yeah. So whenever I started at OBB, I had like a 700 pound squat. And then I guess in those six years, actually two or three years, like I went from there to like a 970 squat. Yeah. Here's a senior nationals in 07, mm-hmm. 920, 617. Kind of like that deadlift. 666 deadlift. <laughs> worst deadlift yeah so it's during that time period the the training was basically brian's minimalist conjugate type stuff it 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 was but then uh since uh since schwab and i we both trained at the same gym we always didn't get to train together yeah because like we had different time different schedules so mine kind of spiraled away from his to where like i called it a hybrid conjugate or what I thought was conjugate. So basically I beat myself into the ground constantly. Everything was max effort. Even my, um, my supplemental days were, were max effort. It's mm-hmm. so like we'd, uh, like for instance, for squat, uh, we'd come in, I knew what bar we were using. Uh, I knew what band we were using and I would, I, the, the box height was this, we, we knew what that was going to be. And I treated max effort as max effort. We would go until I could, we couldn't fucking squat again. Like we would find that that threshold where mm-hmm. it just wouldn't move, and then from there we'd do fucking pin pulls, and we'd do pin pulls max effort, and we would change the pin height every week. So it'd be like a three week wave. So it'd be like pin one, pin two, pin three, and then we'd start over, and then we'd do like three weeks of chains, and then three weeks of bands, and then we'd change the box box height. So and then for bench, like every every week we were in a shirt, and we would just bench to a board. We change the board level. So it'd be like three, two, one touch. And then we start over again. So, uh, all your heavy stuff was on the weekend though. Yes. So the week you had, cause you're 33, 34 at the time. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to say, I mean, you're 20, you can do about anything and recover True. where you're not there yet no. at 33. I mean, <laughs> no. you're older now, so you get what I'm saying. Yes. You're like right in that middle phase yeah. where recovery can be an issue, but maybe not so much. Yeah. But if it's all being pounded on the weekend and then during the week it wasn't so bad it was just accessory shit yeah so like i would like obviously like saturday and sunday and then like there'd be two days during the week there was the accessory stuff um and i was a stay-at-home dad at the time so i didn't have to go to work yeah i I stayed home and took care of my kids so it's not like i had a strenuous thing to do mentally strenuous you know because of you know having my children uh just trying to keep them occupied throughout the day so yeah, it wasn't like other guys that had to go to work and do like hard labor jobs where they're outside and shit. Yeah. So it was easy for me to recover, you know, but uh, yeah, there were times where like I would feel it. Like it obviously it's going to catch up to you sooner or later. Yeah. So the, if I'm understanding correctly, the week training was pretty much just to prepare you for the weekend. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Which I see frequently yeah. with a lot of lifters because it's usually easier to get people together. Mm-hmm on a Saturday or a Sunday Definitely. for the main lifts. But the problem becomes that's a lot of work Yeah, in two days. It is. Which kind of means Friday's off, Monday's off. Yep. And then during the week, it's whatever. Yeah. I think it was like Tuesday and Thursdays when I would do my accessory stuff. Yeah. You know, and sometimes I would do it at home in the garage um, because I would have my daughters with me. Mm-hmm. So I would just go out in the garage. And what train. was that like? Because they were little at the time. Yeah. I, I actually, I, I loved it especially with my youngest one um like like my two youngest ones they would come into the garage with me and hang out whenever i was training and i've got like old videos of nora that would come out and like she would help me put my wrist wraps on when i was benching 
And then after I'd get done doing shrugs, like she'd go over and act like she was lifting the bar and I'd tell her to do like two more reps. Mm -hmm. So being able to have my kids there with me, I absolutely loved it. I loved being able to have them around and seeing what I did and like trying to get an interest never really worked out. I think my youngest one's the only one that really had an, has an interest in doing it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, that was fun. I really enjoyed that. I wish and I tell everybody, I wish I could go back and do it all over again, you know, just to be able to have that time with them that I probably should have taken more advantage of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything you would have done differently with them? <sighs> yeah. I mean, but it's like, it's just in general, like overall, I would have uh, tried to have been a more involved father. You know, I've. How are you not involved if you're with them all day? Because fucking TV, you know, <laughs> I couldn't, like, my hips for, you know, hips are bad. So I can't sit on the fucking floor and play Legos or Barbies and stuff with them. You know, so I, I, I wish if I could go back, I, I wish, like, I wouldn't have had them sit in front of the TV as often. Like, maybe I would have read to them more often, would have uh, played Legos or just been more involved, like going on more walks, taking them to the park and shit like that. You know, but there are some times like I just, I've, I don't, <laughs> I hate being outside because it's fucking hot in Florida. Yeah. And I, I hate the heat and I hate, I hate the fact that I sweat walking from the house to the game on walks and back. So like, that was the main thing that, that kept me from doing a lot of these things. And I know it's, it's a lame thing to say. But, uh, but yeah, if I could go back, those are things that I would do different. Granted, I, I was very involved with my children's lives um, because I, I got the chance to do like band camp with them, go on field trips with them, you know, uh, meet them at school for lunch and shit like that. So that's, I would obviously not change anything about that. I just wish I would have been more involved with them when they were at home. Well, there was a different philosophy on recovery for powerlifting back then as well to yeah. where we would frown. Yes. I'm like, no, you can, don't go to the zoo. Yeah. You know, cause then you got to walk, you got to walk and then you get fucking back. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So that, <laughs> and that was incorrect, uh -huh. you know, kind of looking back exactly. on that whole thing, but it was what was popular. Mm -hmm. So it, was that playing into it as well? It was, it was that mental aspect of it. Like people look down on it and like, Oh, you shouldn't do this because you're not, just, you're not recovering. If you're yeah. not, you're not doing shit. Cause I remember reading stuff that you had written years ago, like about the back pump. Like you would go to like Disney or something and like your back would be fucking tore up, mm -hmm. you know, halfway through the day because of the such the back pump. And it was the same thing with me. Like we go to the fucking zoo or to Disney or SeaWorld and I'm just like, honey, I got to sit down, you know? And like every time we'd come to a stop, I'd sit down as quick as I could. Shit, it even happened whenever I visited my daughter's college. Mm -hmm. Like we were doing a walkthrough of her college and I would sit down. Like every time we'd stop, they'd talk about something. I'd fucking find something to sit yeah. down. Um, so yeah. It, it, Granted, I probably should have been doing it more often. I probably wouldn't have got such bad, uh, bad yeah. back pumps. And that was actually at one point in time, I was working with Jeremy Frey. He was doing my programming and he made me fucking walk like pretty much three or four times a week. He's like, you need to get out and walk. So I would put my baby in the stroller, put, put her in the stroller. And we'd walk around the neighborhood, you know, like four or five times. And I would do that three or four days a week. And he was right. It made a fucking difference. Yeah. You know, my calves didn't get all pumped and swole up and the back pumps went away. So like I should have been listening to Frey the whole time, you know, I should have been doing more walking. Yeah. But at the time, like you were saying, like it was looked down upon. Well, like, I used to plan out like which path I would take based upon where I can stop. Yeah. Like there's benches that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's longer. There's no benches this way. Yeah. But, but it's shorter. It's shorter. I'm going that way. It's like, can I gut through this? Yeah. 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 How bad is this? Yes. Yeah. And then if it's a Disney or something like that, it's like, how far is the bench away from a food stand? <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of processing yes. that goes into planning yep. these routes. I remember my, uh, <laughs> my wife, I remember she went into one show with my daughter and I was supposed to sit outside with my other child and wait. And she came out and my, my daughter and I were gone and she's, she was pissed because she couldn't find us, but like cell phones, like hit or miss whether they fucking work. Mm -hmm. So like my, I, I needed a place to sit down and there was no place to sit out there because everybody else was there. Mm -hmm. So we went into this obvious air conditioned building and sat and watched these stupid fucking parrots. Um, so like I came out and my wife was so pissed off and I was like, listen, I was like, my back was fucking on fire. It's hot. I found a place to go sit down. I tried messaging you. I'm sorry. But yeah, it, it comes to mm -hmm. that point. Like I'm, I was willing to get in trouble and get yelled at just so I could find some air conditioning and a place to sit. Well, comforts. Yeah, definitely.
fucking 93, 98 degrees. Oh, you know, 110 percent humidity in the summer. Florida is a nightmare. God, it's horrible. When I go to visit Bob every now and again, just going from the house to the car yeah. was like, dude, man. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's like, like, you're already when sweating. do I put my shirt on? Because <laughs> you're going to sweat through this shit. Yep. Oh, Carry God. extras. Yes, I do that. Ridiculous. I, I do that at the gym. I, I'll I uh, I'll bring like a squat shirt, and I'm sure you may have seen like I love crop tops. Yeah. Because it doesn't interfere with my gear. So that's what I'll, I'll get there and I'll have one shirt on and I'll put my crop top on and I'll train with a crop top. And then whenever I go home, I put the other shirt back on so that it's not soaking wet. Yeah. Yeah. So like it, you have to do that shit, you know, <laughs> it's, it's bad. Like I know uh, one of the guys we changed train with James LeBron, I think he brings like three shirts, Like he'll train mid training session and then have a third shirt to put on to go home. And we kind of, kind of watch it with the squat though, too, because if the shirt gets too wet, you know, the chalk becomes cake. Yeah. It doesn't hold right. at all, you know, so <laughs> some people overlook that and it, it matters. Yeah. You know, it can make a big oh, difference, does. man. It starts slipping on you. Yeah. With uh, Jeremy, you would have moved from whatever training you were doing more into a block style training. Yeah. The block periodization. Uh, and that was, that was a whole new world for me, man. Like there was a lot more volume that was, that was uh, needed. I didn't quite understand it, you know, and I would just do what Frey told me to do, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it was so confusing because it was so different from the shit I had done. Yeah. But I knew I needed to do something different because I'd gotten to the point where everything was plateauing. Pl plateauing? Plateauing. plateauing. Pl yeah. So that. Stalling. Stalling. It was slowing <laughs> down. So <laughs> so uh, I needed something different because I, I knew something needed to change in order to start making progress again. And Frey was willing to help me out. And obviously he's a strong son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, if, if, if it's working for him, maybe it'll work for me. Um, unfortunately it didn't, you know, I, I forget how long I worked with Frey, but it just got to the point where I felt like I was starting to get more injured because I was having to do so much volume and so many repetitions and shit like that, that I wasn't used to. And it's not at all Frey's fault. Was that on the main lifts? Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember deadlifting like i've never been good at deadlifting I, you know I'm, i've been adequate uh but like i remember like i was pulling one day and i just felt something pop on the left hand side and I, I don't know what it was i don't know if it was my si joint or something um but it was just that because i was doing like high repetition stuff that day um and it just i just finally felt like it i wasn't making the progress i wanted to so i didn't feel like it was for me you know and like i remember asking frey like i would ask frey questions and like he'd, he'd fucking yell at me He's like, he's like, just fucking do it. I'm like, yeah, but why am I doing it? He's like, because I fucking told you to. Mm -hmm. And this is Frey. If yeah, anybody yeah, knows yeah, Frey, yeah. that's just how he works. So I'm like, but Frey, dude, I need to understand this shit. So I know like whenever you're not doing my program and I need to understand it. And I, I couldn't understand it. You know, um, I tried, like I was reading articles and trying to understand the process of it. And I understood it to an extent, but not at the level that he did. Yeah. You know, like he was a master at the stuff. Do you understand it more now? I do. So when you look back, you can see what was wrong. Mm -hmm. it, it makes more sense to me now because I've been exposed to it longer yeah. and seen other people using it. So yeah, it makes sense. Then I think that if maybe I had stuck with it a little bit longer, maybe it would have worked better for me, you know? Um, Cause it, obviously you're, you're not beating yourself down constantly with it. Um, whereas like I was the way that I was doing things. So, and it probably would have made me a better athlete too, like as far as like work capacity is concerned. So like I, I would have been better that way if I would have actually stuck with it a little bit longer. Were you auto regulating any part of it or just doing exactly what it was? I did exactly what Frey wanted me to do. You know, some days it worked out and some days it didn't. Um, like if he prescribed me to do like a certain percentage or RPE, um, I would do that. Like to that, I would work up to that whether it worked or not but that's what I shot for at that point. I didn't understand like you auto regulating. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't understand. Like if it's like, if your seven is going to change from day to day, week to week, month, mm -hmm. month, I didn't understand that. I'm like, well, if I did, if my seven was like 350 last week, then my seven should be like 360 this week. I should be getting stronger. And that was my mentality mm -hmm. it because that's what I've, that's the way I've always been. I think what's the saying? Like if, if all you've got a hammer, yeah. Then the, everything's a fucking nail. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was my mentality of everything. I would just beat it. So like, you know, he's like, all right, you had to do a seven. So I'm like, well, I'm fucking, I'm going to find a seven, but it's going to be, it's going to be better than the last seven. Yeah. You know? So how did you change the training after that? Um, after that, I started working with, uh, Marshall Johnson. 
he did some programming for me and it uh it seemed to work better for me um because he that's whenever like he would give me like a percentage range like 83 to 87 Mm -hmm. so i would be able to figure out like all right maybe today's just 83 not 87 um and there was more repetition stuff like it was primarily bench press that he helped me with and then i tried to I would take what he did for programming for bench and I would try to apply it to squat and deadlift. Mm-hmm. Um, and it worked well. That was whenever I, I actually, I got my best bench. The 680 bench was from working with Marshall and I was doing more repetition with the shirt. Wasn't using boards. You know, it was like every, every rep was me trying to touch. So it got to the point where I was touching like 365 with my shirt and then I benched 680 in that shirt. So I just became, or really good at touching at that point in time. And it mm-hmm. was with the old, uh, the old Jack, mm-hmm. that orange, you know, atrocity that we had. So like, so that's, that was the way that my training changes that I had ranges of what I could use. And that's whenever I started understanding, like you say, the auto regulation, like maybe today, 83 is all that's going to work for me, you know, maybe and then the next week, maybe 87 works. Mm-hmm. So that's whenever it all started kind of coming together. So how old were you at that time? Oh shit. <laughs> Fuck. Early forties. I think it was whenever uh, the XPC, I think it was like 44, 45. All right. So then how did you pivot your training after that then? Because at some point you had to start figuring out yeah. what worked for you and what didn't work for you. That's So after that, I pretty much, I did all my, that's, I think that's whenever I moved um, from Orlando Barbell. Like I started training at CTX because I like Orlando Barbell, like, like we talked about, people come and go. So it got to the point where I showed up one Sunday to train and no one else showed up. So I couldn't, I couldn't squat that day, mm-hmm. you know, I'd, unless I wanted to put my, my life in my own hands, like, like uh, Mike Teixeira does, but uh, like, I wasn't ready to do that. So I sat there for about an hour and nobody showed up. So I'm like, I got to find another place to train. Mm-hmm. And luck, luckily there was CTX that was down the road a little bit, but uh, that's where Danny Tenehara was training, um, Alan Pilly. Uh, John Hallman, Mike Francis. So there was all these really strong dudes that were just hop skipping away. So I started training there and uh, their training was different. Um, but, you know, obviously Danny's very technical and very mm-hmm. well thought out on what he did. So like whenever I was training there, I would bounce things off of him, you know, which, how do you think about this? And, you know, he would offer his, uh, his suggestion. So it, it, um, it came to the point where like I would squat one week and then deadlift another. I wouldn't do them both at the same mm-hmm. time, the same week, because it was just, it was too much for me at that time. Um, bench press, like it would be th- like maybe two or three weeks in a shirt and then two or three weeks out of a shirt. So I started trying to listen to my body more, thanks to Danny and, and all of them, because rather than just continuously beating and beating and beating it down, I would give it time to rest, to recover, uh, to feel better. Um, so yeah, so it was just like, I started alternating weeks so that I wasn't doing squat and bench or everything heavy in the same week. Like everything started changing to where it would like a, a heavy squat and heavy bench maybe, and then a heavy deadlift by itself one week. So that's how things started changing when I got to CTX. Was that when you hit the 2400? Yes. I was at CTX when I hit the 24. All right. And what other things changed with that? I mean, was it, was the training still Saturday, you know, heavily based on the weekend or did it break out yeah um well i think the 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 bench changed i think we benched if i remember right i think we benched wednesdays or thursdays uh, because a lot of these guys you know mike francis was retired alan owned the gym so like we could all train on a weekday together because i was i think i was still a stay-at-home dad at the time um house husband so like it was, it worked out to where we could bench in the week and then we would still squat. I think we still squatted on Sundays. Like it was still the same thing. So everything was spaced out. It wasn't like back to back to back. Mm-hmm. So that helped a lot too. Cause it wasn't like heavy, heavy, you know, and then you just, you just feel beat up. Cause uh, at, at that age, like I, it was really starting to catch up to me. Like I would feel it for days afterwards. Whereas opposed to whenever I was younger, I didn't feel it for days. Mm-hmm. How did you manage the recovery then? Uh, a lot of naps. I, like, and I know like Vinny DeZenzo talked about like one aspect that people miss a lot as far as recovery is concerned is taking naps. Mm-hmm. And uh, I took that to heart. And whenever I had time, if I had time to take like an hour nap, I would take it. Like my daughter was a little bit older then and she would, she's okay. She's like, Hey baby, I'm going to take a nap. I would take it on the couch. So if she needed me, she could still get me. But yeah, that, that is whenever I started, uh, I would take naps and feel so much better mm-hmm. because I, what I, had trouble sleeping. Like I was having to take, um, 
trazodone to help me sleep. So like I, I would have trouble falling asleep. So I'd lay there till like three o'clock in the morning and then finally fall asleep. And I'd have to get up at six to get my other girls ready for school. So, uh, so the trazodone helped me stay or fall asleep so I could sleep at least my five or six hours. And then I'd take an hour nap during the day. So that would, you know, add up to what I needed to feel better. Mm -hmm. Um, started paying more attention to my nutrition, you know, which was something like, um, and the, I think this nutrition kind of took, came into place whenever I kind of got to storm, uh, because, uh, Seth and Miana and Danny would, you know, just giving me shit about protein intake and water intake. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking to you about. Where do you think your protein intake was? I mean, where? Oh, it was shit. I was getting protein, but I was getting fat protein. You know, like, uh, like I started paying attention to it, but I was, I was eating fucking, uh, chicken, chicken wings mm -hmm. or chicken strips. Um, and like, I was, <laughs> I was getting like twice as much fat than I was getting protein. Mm -hmm. So like I was getting my 250 grams of protein, but I was getting like 500 grams of fucking fat. Mm -hmm. So like I was gaining weight and I was like, oh, I can't fucking figure it out. And the is like, well, let me, let me look at your, your chart. And she's like, well, that's why I'm like, what? I didn't pay attention to the fat. I was just making sure I was getting protein. So it was because I was taking too much fat in. Mm -hmm. So once I started paying attention to that, trying to drink more water, I'm fucking horrible about drinking water. And me and I'll tell you that. Um, so I was trying to drink more water, trying to pay more attention to my nutrition, making sure I was getting protein because that was one reason I wasn't getting stronger and getting bigger is because I didn't have enough to build off of mm -hmm. uh, sleep, stuff like that. So, I mean, my, numbers may not have shown that i was getting better but my body like i felt better mm -hmm. you know so like i the work capacity was better uh i wasn't so tired afterwards I, I could sleep better stuff like that when was the um i don't know if i want to jump there yet <laughs> so where how how was your training now now it's uh like i have danny tenero who does all my programming um and the reason i asked him too is because after after an equipped meet um, like he and Seth, like helped me, like I, I would do my own programming, but I would bounce things off Seth mm -hmm. and Danny, like I was telling you about, and I'm like, Hey, you know, so I'm doing this today. What do you think the rep scheme should be? Or the RPE should be. And we would, you know, we would auto regulate. So I would get to the point where I'm like, yeah, that, I think I'm, I think I'm done today. I don't know if I can go much further. So, you know, so they helped me figure that kind of out. But then, uh, I did a, I did an equipped meet, had a shitty, shitty meet. I think I, um, forget what it was. Like. I had a good squat, decent bench, but then like deadlift, I was fucked. Like my SI joint was so bad. I had pulled 405 and it was all I could do to pull 405. So after that, um, I'm like, I decided, I'm like, Hey, I'm going to take some time off out of gear, trying to give my body a little bit of time to recover, feel better. And then I was like, you know, I need something to train for in order to motivate myself to continue doing stuff. So I decided to do a raw meet. Hadn't done a raw meet in 25 years. I don't know how to train for a raw meat anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Danny, I need your help. So Danny, uh, decided he did programming for me. Um, so every how'd that first squat session feel? Oh God. <laughs> Fucking like, I'm so used to sitting back. You know, I had no idea about knees forward using quads and shit like that. So like, like I'm fucking sitting way back on my heels and like, there's nothing there to catch me. And it was just miserable. Like four Oh five just felt like a ton. Mm -hmm. So like I had to, I had to relearn how to squat. I had to relearn how to use wraps to get more rebound and knees forward more, uh, using, using more quad as opposed to posterior chain. It, it took me the entire training cycle to try and f to figure that shit out. Mm -hmm. Like it was finally like the last three or four weeks where it all finally came together and I understood. How was your recovery throughout all this? That was amazing. Uh, it, Cause there's, there's so much less thought and stress that goes into it. Like having to squeeze into gear, uh, fuck my, you know, the briefs are too tight or too loose. Yeah. You know, so like it There's was less load on your spine. So too. much, so much better. Like I, I, I felt better. I would feel better about myself after training. Obviously I'm not moving the weight that I wanted to, but I got, I felt I would leave feeling like there was more I could have done. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's a weird mental place to be though, right? Because yeah. you're not handling the same amount of weight, but you don't even know. Exactly. And then the numbers aren't what you mm -hmm. really think they should be, no. but you still don't know. Right. So you don't know if it's good or not good. Yeah. And I was trying to compare myself to other people like in my age and weight class. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing wrong? I'm like, what? 500 pounds. 
you know, I'm squatting over a grand in gear, mm -hmm. 500 pounds raw. It just felt like fucking heavy mm -hmm. because everything, all of my leverages and everything was off. Like I couldn't figure it out. Um, bench press was really weird because of my fucked up elbow. So like, and I, I had to learn to bench reverse grip, or as I call it, like iron or mm -hmm. like claw. So it was like a modified reverse grip because that was the only way that my elbow wouldn't hurt. Um, because anything re regular grip, like my elbow grinds and rotates and it's really fucking painful, but in a gear, it's not so bad because my hands are wider and my elbows don't bend as much as they did in, in raw. So I had to learn to work and work in that and work around that pain too, which Danny also helped me because he's like, how's the elbow feel today? And I would tell him and he's like, all right, we'll, we'll do this. So it was like, we would pivot depending mm -hmm. on how the elbow felt that day. So, uh, yeah. So it was, yeah, it was just, it was a weird thing to try and learn. And that's like, that's when like I was, my deadlift just like tanked too. And like, we've, we've still, we're still trying to figure it out. Can't figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, you know, like my best pulls 720. Like I fucking, it's hard for me to pull 405 right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I get past 315 and like everything starts falling apart and we can't figure it out. I mean, I'm still squatting seven, 800 pounds, you know, but I can't pull. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. What was the end result of the meet that you did raw? Um, see, I squatted 672. The goal was 700, but I, I knew after my second attempt, like I wasn't going to hit seven. And that's what I was talking about. Shane and Craig were there at the meet and I was bouncing ideas off to them. They're like, God, oh, just do 672. So 672, I stood up with it relatively easy. You know, I won't say it was a cakewalk, but I, I probably could have done a little bit more. I benched like 396. The goal was like 400. Um, so obviously I didn't get that. And then like, they yeah, got pulled 472, mm -hmm. you know, which was kind of embarrassing because here's this dude squatting like close to 700 pounds and I'm can't pull with like 50. Mm -hmm. So uh, like it went to the point where like I was one of the last guys squatting to like I was the first motherfucker on the deadlift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so the, it, it wasn't a bad meet. It was actually one of the, the least stressful meets I've ever done because there was a lot less that went into it. How like, so? Uh, warm-ups. Like f for squat warm-ups, I think I did like six or seven warm-ups and I was ready. You know, I didn't have to worry about getting my gear on, timing it to put my squat suit on, knee wraps, shit like that. So it was more, there was less mental stress. Fuck, for bench press, like I opened at like 315, so I had like two warm-ups mm -hmm. and I was ready. Mm -hmm. You know, deadlift, I opened at 405, so again, it was two fucking warm-ups. <laughs> yeah. So like I'm just sitting around shooting the shit with everybody. You know, I was just having a good time. So like I mentally, like I actually had a great day at that meet. Like I had fun, like hanging out with people and shooting, hanging, talk, shooting shit, um, talking about training, seeing people I haven't seen and then getting the lift at the same time. And just, there's no stress to it. Now that meet was last year or the year before? I think it was two years ago. Two years yeah. ago. How was it when you transitioned back into gear? It was easy. Like it was like riding a bike. Okay. So it, 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 it was, and Danny actually brought that up. Cause like I've spent all that time out of gear and then we put gear back on and I immediately just fall back into where. I needed to be. So it was, it just, I've been doing it for so long. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just, you know. How did natural. the strength feel going back? Um, not bad. Um, it, it did take me a little while to get to where I was before. Um, cause I was still dealing with the SI joint issue. So it, it did take some time to get back to where I, I needed to be, you know, and I still, uh, at the S, I still haven't quite, still have an issue. So I haven't gotten back to where I was like that 1025 squat, I think was the, the last one I did before I did the raw meet. Um, so like, I think I'm, I'm just now back over seven mm -hmm. because of the issues I've been having. Like it, the, the SI feels like there's like a odd, a hot rod being driven into my SI joint. So it doesn't really hurt when I pick and squat. It hurts whenever I'm unloading. Mm -hmm. So like whenever the pressure comes off, it it's really bad. Like it got to the point where like when I was training for that last raw, that last geared meet, like I would edit my videos so that people couldn't see me screaming in pain after I would get done squatting. Because mm -hmm. I didn't want people to see that was going on. But it was it was bad enough to like my training partners knew it was coming. So like as soon as I'd get done, like they'd run up to hold on to me because mm -hmm. they knew I was going to 
scream out in pain and they, they would hold up and pop my belt off and my knee wraps and stuff. Um, so they knew it was coming, but I just didn't want other people to see it. Yeah. How long would that last before the next set? <sighs> well, I guess it would, it would pretty much go away. I'd, I'd come out from like two or three steps and like the pain would go away. All right. But then, so I'd just do it all over again. And it was the same way. It, it, it's been going on now for like four or five years. Like it just keeps switching sides. Mm -hmm. It'll go from the right side to the left and the left side will get better. And then like, I'll do like two or three months and then it all of a sudden pops back up on the right side. What have you tried to help it? Uh, we've done a lot of, cause I've got muscular imbalances. So this is something that Danny has, we've, Danny has addressed. Like I've got glute, glute weakness on one side so that the piriformis is doing more of the work, which is turning and twisting things, which is why the SI joint is, is hurting so much. So we're doing a lot of unilateral work, um, stability training, uh, core work. Cause I didn't, I, I hated doing core stuff. Um, so like he's, he's added that in pretty much every session. Whereas I would do it like every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of things that I wouldn't think of doing like a single leg RDL, but he's like, I'm doing it with like a pronated foot to where I'm reaching the across there for like obliques and, and stabilization and rotation. So like, these are things that I would never have thought of to do myself, which is why I asked Danny to help me out mm -hmm. with. So, um, trying to like, all the other shit that he has me do now is the the si issue that you were talking about is it load dependent yes um like it it normally is fine until i get over seven mm -hmm. once i get over 700 pounds that's whenever it normally kicks in now has that that number changed no so it's still seven still seven. okay yeah because i thought it was i thought it was going to get better because mm -hmm. uh, there was that one like after the raw meat and i started back i was like oh it's not so bad i like, this is fucking nice 500 cool 600 cool get over seven all of a sudden there it is again mm -hmm. so anything over seven is whenever it starts hurting you can't figure it out can't figure out how to get it to stop uh, we we've done more stretching um we've done like specific si stretches like i'm up against the wall and like there's a fucking um the foam roller and like i'm reaching this way because i've like my upper my thoracic mobility is shit too yeah you know so um was this happening when you were training raw? Yeah, it was still, it was still a problem, mm -hmm. uh, but it just, it wasn't as much of a problem because it wasn't as much weight. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really, it, it was, it affected me, but not in the same way. So I, um, so like the, the only time that my SI joint really hurt, cause I was like, and it's also like whenever I squat narrow, it doesn't hurt as bad as whenever I squat wide. So I had a lot, a lot less SI pain whenever I was squatting narrow. Uh, but every time that we would get like 650 to 700, it would start hurting again, but not nearly as intense. Mm -hmm. It was a lot managed, more manageable and easy to deal with. So, yeah. So, it, yeah, they didn't, it didn't really affect me so much in the raw training as it does in gear. Mm -hmm. When was the, um, I, I'm going to ask, when was like the first injury, but that, major right so when was like the first major injury when did that come um i don't know if we'll call it major but it was like my my elbow it was the first surgery yeah so when was that <sighs> shit remember what meat you were training for it was like it was right after the uh the aapf nationals oh that god was so in, you're going back yeah it was like lake it was like lake placid or something it was metal militia so it was up in new york My eyes are bad. <clears throat> Yours and mine both. Yeah. So if we're going to go AAPF, here we go. So wow. Let's see. It was uh, like 2011. 2011. Yeah. All right. So where the hell is that? Yeah. It was there like, it is. Yeah. It was 2011 that I had my, it was an elbow debridement, mm -hmm. is what it was called. So that was the first surgery that I had was back then. Because they got to the, like, I even remember talking to this, like Sebastian Burns about it trying to figure out what was wrong with my elbow and if they ever had the same issues because every time i would extend my arm it would mm -hmm. sound like gravel so it sounded like somebody walking on gravel so, they, so it took two years is that right or are these just shitty benches shitty benches okay 
All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I see. Yeah. I see him. I, yeah. I got it. I see a miss here at like 695 yeah. in 2012. So the strength was there. So the strength came back pretty quick after it did. that. Yeah. It, it wasn't, it, I wasn't as, as quick as like, um, what's his name? Chris, Chris like had elbow surgery and like was back like two days fucking benching. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like that, but yeah, it was, it was pretty quick. I mean, they ended up taking out like six bone spurs um roto rootering down like the head of the of the uh the ulna and stuff like that because a lot of uh, arthritis had built up so like it was it was night and day after having that done like the pain was gone like there was no gravel sound i finally get it got some more range of motion back to where like i could almost extend my arm the whole way so yeah that was the first major thing that i had done so all your major things have they been bone related Ye yes Right. So yeah. the after the elbow, what came after that? Oh, let's see. The shoulder in there somewhere, isn't that it? That was my L5S1. Mm -hmm. I know. So after that was the umbilical hernia. And then it was the L5S1 discectomy, which was in 2012. Now, how was coming back from that? Uh, it was actually quicker than I expected. Like, I, I thought it was going to be painstakingly long. But um, once I got over the the fear factor of putting weight on my back again, uh, it it moved probably quicker than than probably people wanted it to. Mm -hmm. uh, just simply because that's just my mentality of it. Like I was, I wanted to come back as quick as possible. Like I had a goal of being able, to, like I wanted to squat a grand within a year of having that surgery because I had fuckers telling me that I would never be able to squat a grand again. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one guy say, you'll be lucky if you're able to able to squat a grand again, if you have this surgery, like, there was people trying to talk me out of mm -hmm. the surgery. So like I pushed it. Why did you have the surgery? What was the tipping point? Uh, I couldn't feel my foot and I would, I had so much pain running down my leg that whenever I got out of bed, my wife would have to hold me up while I hollered out in pain. Um, because of it pinching down and pressure on that nerve uh, until like I was able to actually walk. So it was, it was at that point, like I, I, I knew I had to have something done. Mm -hmm. um, Were you still able to train? No, not at all. Like, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't function. Like I could barely walk. I could, definitely, I would have trouble sitting down in the car to drive. So like I, I, I didn't want to try other aspects of fixing things kind of like uh, Carol did. Like I felt like mine was f too far gone. Mm -hmm. I was in too much pain to try and gut through all these other things that were being done. Um, plus I found a neurosurgeon um, and talked to him rather than an orthopedist to have it done. Uh, Cause I wasn't going to let an orthopedist work on my, my spine. It was mm -hmm. going to be a neurosurgeon. So, uh, so that was, how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, basically there was one of the reasons was because my brother-in-law had back surgery pretty much the same thing and he had an orthopedist do it and the orthopedist fucked it up mm -hmm. to where like he's still in pain like he still has pain down his leg he still has numbness in his foot uh and the idea that you've got a doctor that's doing surgery on an elbow one day and next day he's doing spine surgery that just didn't mm -hmm. it didn't sit right with me not to say that all of them are are not good at doing it but i felt like an a neurosurgeon who spends like maybe an average of seven more years learning technique and surgery and spinal and just so I, I felt like I had a much better chance with them doing it right where I could come back and do what I wanted to do than mm -hmm. I did if I had an orthopedist do it. Now when you came back was the pain after you could get through rehab and shit like that mm -hmm. was the pain gone or it was, was it still completely? It was gone immediately. Yeah. Like I remember waking up in the hospital because I was in I was in pain just getting onto the gurney and getting into the mm -hmm. yeah. bed. I was like, I'm hollering out in pain there. And I remember waking up and like, it was just night and day. There was no pain there. I could feel my feet. Like I asked my wife to touch my toes and like, I could feel my toes again. This is fucking miraculous. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was night and day. Like I, and I don't regret doing it. And I've talked to people about it. Like they've come to me asking questions about it. And I, I tell them, I like, I know, I know people are very, touchy about the subject mm -hmm. about her surgery and i'm like look i was like i'm i'm a uh, success with it i don't i wouldn't tell anybody not to do it but i would tell people to do your research on it first and also make sure you find a neurosurgeon ask them questions how many times have you done this what's the recovery rate uh, what what can i expect afterwards you know um just ask them questions say don't be afraid to ask them questions 
Um, Cause if you ask them questions and they give you, you know, a bad response, like the orthopedist, like for my back, like he's like, he wanted to do surgery on me immediately without ever talking to me about alternative methods mm -hmm. or like shots or anything like that. And whenever I asked him questions, he sat back and he crossed his arms at me because I was asking him questions. And immediately I was like, I'm not, this dude's not cutting on me. Mm -hmm. Like this guy just wants me to, he just wants me to put me in a room and cut me open. So like, that's, that's why I, another reason I chose not to use that guy. Did you use shots and shit like that before that? I did. Did uh, you relief? Yeah. The, the first shot didn't work. The second shot did. It was. It was How long did they make you wait between the two? Two or three weeks. Oh, that's not bad. No, it yeah. wasn't. And, and another this was another reason I decided to do it. I'm like, the shots are working. Yes, I can train uh, or with it or around it, but I knew that it wasn't fixing yeah. the problem. Yeah. You know, this is just masking the problem. It's buying time. Right. It's buying me time. Mm -hmm. So like, and I didn't want that. I didn't want to like, oh, I'm just gonna have to depend on shots the rest of my life. So I'm like, I want to get this fixed and get it done so I can, plus um, my mentality was like, I'm, I'm young enough to where I can recover from this and mm -hmm. still do what I want to do. So I'm like, if I put this off and I wait till, you know, a couple more years and then I get it done, the chances are I may not recover as quickly from it or as well because I'm getting older, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's just two more years, but we don't know what happens. So I, I'm like, I'm going to have this done, you know, and, I, and it worked out well. How long did it last? The surgery? The shot. Oh, the shot? Oh, the shot. Actually, the second one lasted like eight or nine, 10 weeks. Like it, it worked really well, you know, to where like it. It almost felt like it, like I was normal again. Mm -hmm. Like I could get up and I wasn't in pain. I, sitting, standing, moving was fine. Like I, everything was great. Did so, you get another one after that? No, I okay. decided. I, right. I just decided not to do the third mm -hmm. one. Just get the surgery done. Mm -hmm. But I had to wait. I think I had to wait that particular time after that second shot in order to have the surgery. Well, yeah, that's I had that with my hip. Yeah, you know, before I had it done is the first cortisone shot. It, it was like, oh my god, it's yeah. fixed. Right, and it lasted. About a year. Oh, did it really? It lasted no a shit. while. And then I got the next one, mm -hmm. and it didn't do shit. Hmm. It was like, oh, we can't do another one for three months or yeah. something like that. I'm like, oh, fuck, man. You know, now this hurts like yeah. a bitch. And when I, it's, um, it's kind of the same condition. When I had it replaced, there was no option. Yeah. I mean, it was hurt so bad, 24-7. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. sleep. I mean, it was just Yeah, there's nowhere to, there, no matter which way you lay, it hurts. Yeah, and yeah. then. Right when I came out of surgery and when they're giving you the ice chips, which are the best thing in the world, by yes. the way, I don't think there's anything better than ice chips post-surgery. I'm arching my back just to see if that pain's still there. Yeah. And it's like, oh, fuck, it's not there. All right. Is it because I'm doped out of my mind right now <laughs> or is it not? And then I'm like, well, and I would like pinch myself uh -huh. or I try to put pain someplace else. To see if you could. Yeah. I'm it. like, okay, I feel pain. Then arch again. I'm like, oh, yeah. I think this is fucking fixed. You know? Yeah. And it was that this, when you came out, was that the same thing? You're like exactly. trying to arch to see if it's still there. I, I did everything I could like twisting, mm -hmm. turning, sitting up, you know, contracting, mm -hmm. bracing just to see if I could feel it. And it was gone. Yeah, I was yeah. so confused because I'm like, this can't be real. Yeah, and it's like, it should, it should, <laughs> like, how does it work this way? Mm -hmm. But I've heard stories like yours of like people getting knee replacements and hips, hips and shoulders and stuff, and they're like, it just it goes away. Mm -hmm. Like the pain level is gone. Like there's no more pain. It just feels amazing. Aside from the surgery. Yeah, you know, because yeah. I was I, actually I was just talking to JL, who uh, messaged me to check on me, which was a surprise. Mm -hmm. like, I didn't even know JL had my number, but JL just had a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it feels great aside from, you know, the yeah, pain the surgery. surgery. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, he's like, the pain is, is again, like I, I keep mm -hmm. saying it, night and day, but he's like, yeah, it's just, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, I've just the, the advancements that they've made being able to replace these things mm -hmm. is just amazing. You no, know, it is. I mean, they still fuck things up. So it should oh, yeah. be a last resort. Agreed. You know, I'm not a doctor, but you know, for me with any of this shit, it's like, this has to be the last resort yes. possible. But I'll dial that back and say when my when my <laughs> second hip started to really fire yeah. up, I'm like, I know what this is like yeah. when it gets too far. Yeah. Like, fuck it, just do it. I know it needs to be done. Right. I don't want to do this again. Well, plus your first one was a success. Yeah. You knew, you knew how well it went. So like, yeah. why am I going to put myself through the shit with the other one? Exactly, because you know? yeah. it's so bad. Exactly. So the, the elbow came back fast, and then yes. the low back was next. Yeah. And that came back moderately fast. Yeah, within... Uh, I guess I did a re the Relentless Detroit meet. So within a year of having the surgery, 
I had actually gotten back. I squatted nine. I squatted nine. This is funny though. I squatted nine at the meet, which I was so excited about, but then I fucking tore my rotator cuff on the bench press. Mm -hmm. Um, like at my opening bench, like I couldn't get it to touch. Um, I felt the tendon tear on my second attempt in my left shoulder, but I knew I needed to get a bench in in order to keep going. So like we adjusted the shirt and shit and I uh, brought it down for my third attempt and I felt it go the entire way. I felt and heard it tear. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I came back from doing that, you know, from recovering from back surgery and then fucking tore my shoulder like immediately. Yeah. Going back to the back, cause I know people are going to be interested in this. How did you do your recovery at that? Um, or how long was it until you were released? There's a lot of questions here Yeah. because there's what you do. Then there's what they tell you to do. Yeah. Right. So, surgery is over and then here's your restrictions are you abiding by those and are you abiding for the time that they wanted you to yes and no so like yeah they i think it was like 10 weeks yeah i think it was like 10 weeks they wanted me to wait um i think i i couldn't wait the whole 10 weeks so i think at eight weeks i was back in the gym but i wasn't doing stupid shit so what are you doing before that uh walking just walking all the time just like i couldn't be complacent so i would walk um, I would, I would do band shit for like my upper body, like presses and shoulders and triceps and biceps, just something to be active. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really couldn't do anything lower body yet because they wanted to wait at least those 10 weeks to try and get everything to make sure mm -hmm. it's good. Uh, but I, I think it was like eight weeks. I was back in the gym, uh, just doing like squatting with a bar. Like I'd use the safety squat bar mm -hmm. and just do repetitions, but I would do it to a high box. So it wasn't putting a whole lot of stress on my lower back, but I still was doing the movement. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, that's why I say yes and no. So yeah. how fast were you progressing the weight? So the first day, obviously, is like the bar. Yeah. Because you're like, can I do the bar? Right. And I was, it was yeah. still worrisome. Like, I'm yeah. like, am I going to fuck this up? Because I don't want to do this again. Then how did you load from just that bar? Um, it was, I do a plate. Mm -hmm. So like, like every, every two weeks was like, I'd like first, like I'd 25. And then a plate, plate and quarter. So it was like, I would try to do it as slow as possible. If something felt off or something was irritated or like I would stop mm -hmm. and just continue where I was at until I was, I could build back up. So like I, I didn't, again, like I didn't do anything stupid. I did like unilateral leg presses. I did a lot of core stability stuff. Um, I did a lot of uh, reverse hypers because at the time I thought that was like the thing that you were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, fucking Superman's. Like you lay on the floor mm -hmm. and do the Superman shit. Uh, what do you call it? This bird dog. I did all the all the the Mac McGill. Yeah, McGill. I did all the McGill stuff that was recommended, along with other stuff that Schwab would suggest. Um, so I just kind of eased back into it. Like I was in a hurry, but I wasn't in a hurry. I wasn't in a hurry so much that I wanted to fuck it up to where I had to do it over again. Yeah, were there like benchmarks that you had that you needed to hit before you would commit to a meet? Um. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. like it's, like it was a while ago, but I know like my my plan was like I had to be able to squat 400 raw mm -hmm. before I would think about putting gear back on, and then like in gear like maybe five or six before in just the briefs before. But that's like once I was able to put briefs on and I was no pain mm -hmm. and everything was going well is whenever I was like, all right, I'm going to do this relentless Detroit meet, um, so that I could train, I could do a meet with like Marshall and some and mm -hmm. um some of the other guys up there and it was also for a good cause. So that was why I was like at, at the point where I was squatting like five and six in briefs, I was like, okay, oh, kid, I can do this meet. So I think it was like maybe an eight or 10 week training cycle for the meet. Um, but yeah, I, I, my plan, like I needed to squat 900 mm -hmm. to prove that I was capable of doing this. And like the, the other, ben the other benchmark is like, I wanted to be able to squat a grand, a uh, two year within two years of, of doing or having the back surgery. So the shoulder fuck up kind of put a, a yeah. hamper on that. How long did you wait to fix that? Shoulder was pretty much uh, immediate because like I couldn't raise my arm. It was funny because I, it was it was uh, it was here. No, it was, so it was in Detroit. It was at the relentless Detroit meet. But I was going through the airport, and I like you know you have to do the fucking arms up thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had to grab my arm and do that. And they're like, oh, you tore your rotator cuff. I'm like yeah. So uh, it was it was almost immediate. I got back and went and saw my doctor. Um, had an MRI. Yep. Yeah. You're torn. So like, 
uh i think they waited a couple weeks to make sure the swelling went down and shit and then like i was worried because like i didn't want it to retract so much that it was like it was gonna be a pain in the ass pull back down so it was like i guess within within a month of it happening that i, I had surgery done on it mm -hmm. and then what was the recovery like with that uh that one was tough because i had to spend seven weeks in a in a fucking uh what do you call it sling mm -hmm. strapped to my body um two weeks straight of sitting up sleeping and it was fucking miserable because i'd every hour i'd wake up in pain and i'd have to change locations like i'd go from one recliner to the other to the couch and then back forth it was miserable so that was that recovery was just horrible mm -hmm. um because like i used a, i think i used a chaos bar or the the bamboo bar um, more than anything so if not for that thing i don't think i would have recovered as quickly as i did how did you use it high repetitions like it like i think i started with like i'd have like a five or a ten hanging off and i would just do like 15 20 repetitions and do like five or six sets of that um i would do the range of motion stuff lying on the floor with like two and a halves which is the only time i would recommend ever using a fucking two and a half because <laughs> i noticed like there's there's like two and a halves over here somewhere that are fucking painted pink. Yeah, it's because they can't find them. Yeah. Oh, really? Because mm -hmm. like like I'm gonna spin off to a different story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had two and a halves at Orlando Barbell, and I fucking took them out one day and I painted them pink, mm -hmm. and then put them back in the gym. And Schwab was not fucking happy with me because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't. Well, there, there's also that reason why I did it too, but there's yeah. not a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. And so when somebody would need to find them, it's like, well, find the pink. Good ones. luck. Yeah. You know, then it's a little easier yeah. to find. I I did it because I was like, yeah, you know. But yeah, he was not happy with me for doing that. So sorry. So well, it makes them easier to find. It was, especially for for the girls that were using them. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he yeah. wasn't. He was not happy with me for doing that because I. So I ended up having to actually replace them because I, I went out. I went to like play again sports and bought new like four new two and a halves. Yeah, and took the other ones home. So I still have them at home in my garage. That's fine. Yeah, I mean it's a or a, a ornament you can hang yeah, on the wall. Exactly. Yeah. So back to the rotator cuff, you were training your lower body mm -hmm. while you're in the sling, I assume. Definitely. Uh, and that, thank God for safety squat bars. Yeah. Cause I would, that's what I would use. And it took me a little while to do it because the safety squat bar would put a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on that. Uh, so like it was, I would squat as much as that would allow me to, mm -hmm. but I think doing that and the fact that I would, I was training this arm really hard while this was in a sling mm -hmm. so i was doing floor presses dumbbell floor presses i was doing incline benches i was doing everything i can with this arm because i believed and i had heard if you train this other side this side still gets stimulated mm -hmm. so it's still going to come back quicker and i believe it actually worked for yeah me. it does so like so i'm i tell everybody i was like if you get this done then do this because mm -hmm. it worked for me so I, I did all kinds of shit, like overhead presses, dumbbell curl. Everything was done with this side to help this side recover. And then, um, so, but with squats, yeah, I was squatting four or five plates still with that thing in a sling, you know, so I was trying to go as heavy as I could to still allow me to maintain and stay strong, even while this was still recovering. How long did it take for you to get that arm under a squat bar, straight bar? Oh, oh shit. Yeah. God. <laughs> like, um probably like four or five weeks after I came out of the sling. That's not bad. That's it, not bad. It, well, it's like, I would obviously, I used the bow bar. Yeah. So like it started like way out here. Like mm -hmm. I was all the way out to the, to the sleeves and like each week I would try to pull it a little bit further in. But uh, thankfully I had a good PT. Uh, his name was uh, uh, Mason, Cliff Mason, uh, which was a guy that trained at the gym too. And he, uh, he helped me tremendously at getting my range of motion back because he knew you know what i did mm -hmm. how i did it and my mentality of it all so he, he would push me like so with those first ones that you were doing did you force it to get under there or yeah. was it already there no i'm not gonna lie I forced right. it. okay yeah I, I i i but like it would be like i couldn't do the pinky over mm -hmm. so it'd be like here yeah so like and then like it'd be here so eventually i was able to get my hands over it and then it would move back in mm -hmm. but yeah it was uh it was not comfortable that first day and i kind of regretted it because i got home and like the next two days, I was sore as shit. Mm -hmm. Like I was icing and, you know, tramadol and all kinds of shit trying to get the pain to go away. But uh, yeah, so it, it, I forced it some. Mm -hmm. And then what was the uh, next injury to come after that? Because <sighs> there's a list. I know. <laughs> I had to actually make the list because I had to write it down for my, uh, let's see. So in 20, 
So 2013 was the first shoulder. 2017 was the uh, T1, T2 discectomy. Mm -hmm. And um, like I had that done after one of the XPC meets. Because I remember we, uh, like Ashina did an interview with me after. And I talked about how I was having this like shooting pain in my back. And I didn't know what it was. So I had to get it looked at. And turned out I had a herniated disc at T1, T2. And it hurt whenever I squatted because the bar sat mm -hmm. right there on that fucking herniation. But it got bad enough to, uh, it was, and also weird because the, what finally was the tipping, the, the tipping of the scale is I was doing fucking um, kettlebell swings and it was with a heavy kettlebell and I brought it up and I felt a pop and like, I'm like, what the fuck was that? And like immediately I could feel burning sensation into my shoulder blade and down my arm. And it got bad enough to where like I'd wake up in the middle of the night, like screaming out in pain and my wife would try to rub where it was hurting and it would actually make it worse. So like, here I am fucking screaming at her to stop touching me, mm -hmm. even though she was trying to help because it made it worse. So like, again, I was like, I, I know I'm to the point where this has to be mm -hmm. taken care of. So I went back to the same dude, um, uh, uh, Chris Baker, who's the neurosurgeon. And, uh, he put me back together, you know, and it actually, I recovered quicker from that than I did from the lower back, which was surprising because that's where the bar was sitting. But I guess because I knew what to expect. Um, so it, like, it, it seemed like it actually recovered quicker. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if maybe because of the musculature there was used to holding a lot of weight. So like maybe it just recovered better. It was like a like callus, if you will. Mm -hmm. So like that didn't take much long or much time. To, I still, I think I still took like the eight to 10 weeks in order to just make sure everything was good to go. And then like, but I progressed a lot quicker with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I did, I used the safety squat bar first, you know, just to make sure that more weight was on my shoulders than on my, on my neck, which sometimes worked, sometimes didn't, but, uh, but yeah, that one recovered a lot quicker than I expected it to. So, but, and then after that, let's see next one. <laughs> uh, so and then 2018 was my right shoulder. So I tore the supraspinatus on my right shoulder in 2018. And I did that benching at benching at OBB still. Um, and I did that benching raw and uh, like 365, I was supposed to do like three reps and I felt it pop on the second one. Mm -hmm. um, but then me being who I am, not fucking really smart. I'm like, oh, let's, let's do another set. So I put three, I did another one. I did like one rep and I was like, yeah, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, ended up, I went to the, uh, to like an urgent care immediately after told the doctor, let me hey, or PA. Fucking hate PAs, you know, no offense to all of them, but I don't, I haven't had not, I had a good, uh, interaction with many P and PAs, but he's, I'm like, yeah, dude, this happened. I'm pretty sure I tore my supraspinatus cause it feels exactly like the left one did. And he did some stuff on me. He's like, oh no, you're not torn. He's like, I'll give you a cortisone shot. So then he gave me a cortisone shot in my rear delt. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, oh, well, it's systemic. It'll work the same. I'm like, no, it's fucking, it's torn up here, dude. He's like, why are you giving me a shot back there? So when he did that immediately, I'm like, the fuck? Mm -hmm. So, so I scheduled an MRI and went and had it done. And sure enough, it was like a 75% tear. So I went ahead and went and saw my orthopedic doctor and uh, had him just fix this one. And, mm -hmm. go ahead. and this one recovered probably 10 times faster than the left one did because I knew what to expect. I knew what to do. Uh, the range of motion came back quicker. I wasn't in a sling for seven weeks. I think it was like four weeks and I was out of the swing. Now with the first one, was it completely detached? Yeah. All right. Yeah. It was completely torn. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I think if I would have stopped after that second bench where I felt it pop, then I would have been okay. But since I decided to do that third attempt and it popped all the way. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, I'm sure that that prolonged mm -hmm. the recovery of it, but they, I think whatever he did this one, since it was already 75%, I think he went ahead and cut it the rest of the way and then put the anchors in and just did the same surgery on the right side that he did mm -hmm. on the left. And then what happened after that one? As far as like surgeries or yes. just, yeah, well, the next surgery on the list, uh, the next surgery is just this one that just happened. Okay. Yeah. The one that I, I just had, uh, the, the C five to T two. Yeah. Go two, ahead and pull his Instagram up for that one. So we have a visual aid. Yeah. All right. So go back. <clears throat> So that first one yeah, there, that one there, is that right after? Yeah, that's right after. They, they got to put a fucking tube in me to let me drain. I had to stay overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they weren't expecting me to stay overnight, but I guess there was more shit that they had to do than expected. Mm -hmm. So they kept me overnight for pain management, put a drain in, 
Now, what was this? What would they do here? Uh, this, they was, they did a, I always, I think I told you this earlier, yeah. I fucked this one up, is for raminotomy, a hemi, laminectomy, and then a uh, micro, uh, micro discectomy at T1, T2. Okay. So they did all of this at the same time. I was expecting just, there was only supposed to be two levels is what I thought was like C7 and T1 was the levels they were going to work on. But then come to find out whenever he sent me the thing of what they're going to do was like, uh, C5 all the way down to T2. Um, so C5 down to C7, I think they just did the laminectomy and the four, four nomotomy. Uh, they opened up. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like I was telling you earlier, uh, the T1, T2 found out it wasn't actually herniated like they expected. It was just a buildup of scar tissue since 2018, whenever I had the first surgery. Uh, so they had to just basically clean things out uh, because of the pressure, like the, everything that was built up there. So. Um, now this was two weeks ago yeah just two weeks ago all right go and click back out so then that which one the latest that's so this now is, this is a week later mm -hmm. and then the last one is the one that i just posted on thursday so what does it feel like okay. now uh actually uh all the nerve pain that i was having after the surgery is pretty much gone it comes and goes here and there, just depending on how I'm sitting or if I move my head the wrong way. So what was the tipping point for this one? Uh, bench press. I showed up to bench one night, um, got my bench shirt ready, you know, sprayed it down, started warming up. I got to like three plates and I went to push and it wouldn't go. Like it, like I'd get it halfway and it would stop. Like it, I couldn't extend. So like I, I tried like four different times to get it to go. And it wouldn't. So I'm like, all right, well, maybe it's just a bad day. Mm -hmm. So I uh, see it. So the next week, got my bench shirt ready. And I'm like, all right, it's going to be a good night. Fucking two plates. I think I did two plates for three reps, and I, that was as far as I could do. So I'm like, all right, well, fuck, I think something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So I give it one more week. And the next week I came in, we did one plate. I did six reps, and that's all I could go. Like I could push this arm, the left arm would go, but the right arm, like it would just drag. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I'm just. It was like it wanted to react, but it couldn't. Like there was the signal wasn't getting there. So I'm like, all right. I told Danny, I'm like, something's wrong, dude. I was like, I, I can't feel it. This doesn't feel right. So that's whenever I decided to, like, I, I scheduled the appointment to, uh, to get an MRI. Or I actually asked one of my buddies who's a chiropractor to order me an MRI so that I could figure out what was going on. Um, and it came back like, like I'm reading it and like to me and like, I'm like, oh shit, I'm fucked. Like, mm -hmm. it's like it was like bulge, 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 herniation, stenosis, you know, all this shit. Oh my God, I'm, what the fuck's happening? Like, I'm done. So, like, I, I just sent it all over to my neurosurgeon um, and had scheduled an appointment for him to look at. And of course, he's like, oh, it, it doesn't look that bad. I'm like, well, I mean, are we looking at the same fucking mm. MRI? So he's like, well, I want to do another uh, MRI because I think that they even got the levels mixed up, mixed up. I'm like, all right, cool, dude. So he did one that was more thoracic. So it comes back. Um, again, it just the T1, T2, everything else seemed to be fine. You know, there's obviously some compression. Uh, so I go to see him or like, they call me back and they're like, I go to see him again and again. He's like, oh, it doesn't look that bad. I don't, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. So, and then like maybe a week or two later, I get a call from his PA and his, she's like, oh yeah, we're looking at doing a, uh, um, a fusion. I'm like, wait, I was like, doc just told me that it didn't look that bad. Why are we talking about a fusion now? I was like, I don't want a fusion. So like I, so like I scheduled him under the appointment to do a tele, tele, uh, televisit mm -hmm. and I talked to him and again, he's like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to open you up. We'll clean you out, fix this in there. And he's like, we'll put a couple screws in. And I was like, hold on. He's like, what do you mean screws? He's like, oh yeah, we're going to do a fusion. I was like, doc, I don't want a fusion. I was like, I, I don't want to do that. That's to me, that's like the last step. Mm -hmm. So that's whenever he suggested the four anatomy. Yeah, I think I did it right there. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, well, I like that better. So uh, like, that's just, that's where we decided to go with. And it was simply because like, I wasn't in any pain this time. Like I was with the first two surgeries, like there was no pain. I was still squatting and deadlifting, you know, with no problems. Mm -hmm. Like I was sleeping fine. There was no issues like radiating pain. Uh, they just had numbness in my fingers. Couldn't feel these at times. And it would come and go, like I'd be driving and all of a sudden, like my fingers would go numb simply because of the way I was sitting. So it wasn't, it wasn't a pain issue. It was a a performance issue like i st still want to do this mm -hmm. like, i still want to train i still want to lift I still want to power lift um so i'm like i i need to get this fixed now because based on what he and i talked about like 
back problems run in my family. Um, so the stenosis, no amount of exercises I do is going to make that get better. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's just going to progress and get worse. And I did some talking to other people and I you know, listened to some things online about how a lot of older people that have stenosis, if they don't get it treated, it, it can lead to paralysis because it pinches down on those nerves enough to where they just stop functioning. And I didn't want to get to that point. So I decided to go ahead and have it done now at the age of 50, rather than waiting until 52, 53, 54, to where, like, again, the chances of recovery and continuing to do this stuff was diminishing. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to go ahead and have it done. Um, Marshall just asked me the other day, he's like, do you, do you regret doing it? I was like, or something along that line. He's like, um, and I was like, at this point, I don't regret it, but I don't, like, I, I'm not feeling the benefits of it yet because obviously I can't test it out. Yeah. You know, so I don't know if it's going to work or it has worked until I'm actually able to press or push again. I was like, but I, I don't regret the, the long term aspect of it because I know that this should help me in the long term to where that I'm not going to have issues mm -hmm. with losing feeling or the paralysis and shit like that. It should have fixed that. Or not well, fixed yeah. it. When do you think you can start training with it? Uh, I'm supposed to wait another month before I can do PT. And I don't know how long after that. Like, I haven't talked to him about that yet, about how long I can bench. I can wait to bench. Um, I'm assuming, like, if I'm doing physical therapy, I can start doing some kind of movements. Maybe not on a pad, but, like, some standing stuff with bands or using a barbell against bands. Just something to where I'm, I'm able to press but I'm not putting pressure on my neck mm -hmm. against the pad. Um, I know that my wife is very adamant about me taking my time to come back because this is a much larger surgery than I've had in the past. Um, and because she keeps reminding me of how old I am. <laughs> she's, she's really good at that. Joe, you're 50. I know I'm 50, but I, I still want to do this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll probably, I'm, I'm going to try to listen to her and, you know, understand what she's talking about because I, I again i don't want to have to do this again mm -hmm. um so i'm going to take my time and coming or coming back try to do it the right way um obviously i've got people like danny to help me out um so you know we've got some things to work on and work around plus then during this downtime this is something that gives me time to work on my hip mobility my si joint problems stuff like that so since i can't do, really do upper body i can still do these other mobility exercises that i've been needing to do so I'm going to say probably eight, 10 weeks. I'll probably start benching again, but obviously not heavy, just movement. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a break real quick. I got to use the bathroom okay. and we'll light these up. All right. <clears throat> Elite FTS was founded in 1998 with the aim to live, learn, and pass on. We've done this through training related content that allows you to become the strongest athlete and coach that you can. Over the past two decades, actually two and a half decades, we've published more complimentary training media than anybody else in the industry. When you look at the number of articles, the Q and A's, the blogs, the videos, the podcasts, there's over a million pages of content that we've put out there. We've been able to do this through your support of Elite FTS. So when you purchase Elite FTS strength equipment, bands, accessories, gear, apparel, or anything through the site, you directly help support the content that we put out, which in turn helps support other people on their journey of becoming stronger and better coaches. So stronger athletes and better coaches, which encompasses the aim and the vision to live, learn, and pass on. So I thank you for the support that you've been giving for the past 25 years and encourage you to keep supporting Elite FTS into the future so we can all help more people become better and stronger. Discount code TABLETALK for 10% off your first order. All right, guys, if you like the Table Talk podcast, then you're going to love the crew. If you're struggling with trying to get through a sticking point, you're trying to figure some specific aspect of your training out that you 
just can't dial in. You're dealing with injuries. You're trying to figure out how to better optimize your training. All the stuff you're seeing on social media is confusing. And all you need is a little guidance and support or just somebody to look at your lifts to make sure that they're either heading in the right, right direction or if there's a weak point in the lift, they can point out what that weak point is. Well, that's what we have the crew for. So when you join the crew, you get an extra Table Talk podcast each month called The Crew Cast. You also get access to our Discord community, which has a training Q&A, form checks with top coaches, mindset section, nutrition, training logs, programs, over 30 ebooks, plus exclusive ebooks just for the crew, webinars, lectures, seminars, giveaways from ranging from full strength equipment. We've given away many yoke bars this year. We've given away actually pieces of strength equipment as well as accessory items and you get exclusive crew discounts. So go to the link in the description that says join the crew, click it, join now and start getting stronger today. All right guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tee that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tee that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star tee, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically you just pop the pad on the bar, reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. I want to circle back to something that you said right before a break, which I think is important because you just had uh, surgery on your fucking upper back for make things easy. Yeah. And you have this time, or if we speak block training, right? You have this block right now mm -hmm. where this is going to have to take time to heal. Definitely. But it's a shitty time period if you're a meathead, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't do what you want to do. But it's also a time to circle back and address a lot of the other things that you right. know you should have been addressing. Definitely. But you don't, which actually kind of makes training suck even more so. Mm -hmm. But you know you have to do it. Yeah. So you noted the hip mobility. And what are some of the other things that you're going to focus on? Basically, it's a hip hip issues. Um, I, have, I have a shift whenever I'm squatting. And the funny thing is, like, this hip shift has been around for a long time because Matt Leduski actually pointed it out years ago mm -hmm. about me shifting. And I was like, yeah, I can't fix it. He's like, well, you need to address it. Otherwise, it's going to cause problems down the road. And he was fucking right. Mm -hmm. So now it's causing problems. So this is something I need to address because I've got weaknesses in my glutes and my piriformis. My QL is overactive. Piriformis is overactive because the glutes aren't firing like they're supposed to. And mm -hmm. I use that term loosely. Uh, so like I need to fix that to where they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And I don't have other muscles compensating for those, that lack of strength and ability to do those things. Mm -hmm. So like I, I do a lot of, um, hip rotation stuff that Danny has me doing against bands. Um, I have an issue with my, my groin on the right side. I'm pretty sure I tore an adductor years ago. Um, I remember it happening, but it like, it never bruised or anything. And it didn't, it didn't hurt to squat in briefs. It just hurts in general. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So that's something else I need to address because there are days like it's, uh, it's hinders my ability to do other things. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. God, Fucking, they always get me. Oh, the monsters. Yeah. They yeah, always yeah. get me, dude. So, uh, so yeah, so that so that that needs to be addressed my thoracic mobility um because there's an issue whenever i bench whenever i'm trying to arch the little arch that i have um i have this knot on my right side basically in my lower lat right around my the bottom of my rib cage that is horribly bad to where it takes my breath away and it, it after a while it actually becomes a lump to where if i lay on my stomach you can see it raised up on one side so the thoracic mobility is is limited so i need to address that and danny's got exercises for me to do like um in like a like a kneeling stance to where you're rotating from one side against the band like upright position and then lower position things to do up against the wall uh for 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 upper body um some things to do with quads like he's he does what we call like sloth um 
step downs Mm -hmm. and those are fucking miserable because he doesn't allow me to do them holding anything like i'm supposed to do it just free like free stance and those are horrible because of my what do you call it my balance is off too so these are all things that are being addressed which are probably leading to the problem of my si joint Mm -hmm. is um i shift because of the imbalance um i shift because of my stability is off um so these are things that i've got that I, luckily i've got danny that's going to help me address because these are exercises i don't know to do mm-hmm. danny is very technical very smart very well educated in this area like he's devoted pretty much his entire life to learning this stuff so i'm glad that i've got him to to help me along here because if it was just me you know again like every everything's a fucking nail yeah like i try i i try to learn things the way that he does but his his approach to it is just so much more intrinsic yeah is the is the frequency of these things going to be more obviously it should be more than once a week right definitely yeah and these are things that that i can do at home too Mm -hmm. um so once i'm able to do these things you know move freely without issues here then i'm going to start doing them at home because i've got a whole bunch of bands at home foam rollers at home you know just light dumbbells at home that i can do things with um so but i'm more apt to do them if I do them at the gym, then at home, because if I'm at home, like I, there's, there's not so much more and this is something that I've talked about before. The motivation isn't always there, but my dedication is always there. So I'm dedicated to do it because I want to do it. So like, but I'm, but if I'm around other people, I'm more apt to hold myself accountable mm-hmm. and do it because, you know, I, I don't want to let them down either, mm-hmm. you know, cause They've been very supportive of me and helping me out through all of these issues, especially CTX and Storm, because those are my like my gym families. So like I don't I don't want to not be involved or not be dedicated to doing this shit because they've they've put in so much effort to help me get to where I am, mm-hmm. you know, or to help me through these rough spots, you know, and then the pain and shit like that. If you were to advise yourself, mm-hmm. you know, going back. <laughs> You know what there's different parts here so what would you say training wise training wise um well i'm asking because you've gone through linear you've gone through kanji you've gone through block you've gone through all these different modalities right and i think you have to go through a lot of those things to figure out what works yeah but at a certain point you kind of know in your head what works for you Mm -hmm. and it may not have worked back then either i get that but let's assume it would have yeah you know how would you have laid things out um i i would say like try to be more open-minded uh in in i guess the way that because people would try to tell me like joe you're doing it wrong and i would say you know no i'm not just because it's working for me right now doesn't mean that it's it's not going that it's going to continue working for me Mm -hmm. so there's always other ways to approach the problem so I was very headstrong. I'm like, hey, I'm doing this because this works for me. And like I was at one point in time training with me, like I, I was a real dick to train with. Mm-hmm. Like um, if say you're squatting with me, like you're going to do what I'm doing. Like if I'm doing bands and, and this bar and this box height, this is what everybody else is going to do. And it sounds conceited and it sounds bad. And it probably was it's like, I'm not going to fuck myself up or like fuck my training up in order to accommodate you Mm -hmm. so i'm like this is what i'm doing if you don't want to do it then you have to do it somewhere else so like i i wish then i would have listened to people because like maybe their ideas would have helped me progress better and not get injured you know so i i guess if i could that's basically what i would tell Mm -hmm. myself is i'd be open-minded about training modalities or training programs is like not everything is not just because it's working for you now doesn't mean something else is going to work for you even better Mm -hmm. what about on the technical side technical um i don't know technical um like i I feel like i had i had a good coach in the technical aspect of it um so like schwab was very helpful mm-hmm. you know and learning to use gear especially bench shirts um would you have used the gear more or less probably less yeah definitely less because 
you know, benching every single week as heavy as possible, you know, and just changing boards and in, and in denim shirts, nonetheless, because they're, they're not very forgiving on your shoulders, you know, which is what I'm sure led to my elbow and shoulder problems was the, just the amount of time that we spent in those denim shirts. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would have suggested, and I, I guess I do tell people this, like new guys that are into gear. I was like, you know, do, do it in like two or three weeks, you know, two or three weeks in briefs, you know, do like a squat or a, a raw week or two and then put the briefs back on, um, especially in a bench shirt, two or three weeks and then give it two or three weeks in raw. You know, you can still use like a slingshot or something like that if you want to. But um, at, if you're doing that, then don't look so much as max effort. You know, where the hard uh, RPEs or the high RPEs do more like repetition work, um, just shit like that. Um, so you don't have to be in gear all the time in order to learn it. I mean, it it helps, but it's it it it, it could also be a hindrance. Mm -hmm. I mean, because if you're in gear and that's all you're doing, then there's all these supporting muscles that are required to use the gear. They're suffering because you've got all the support on. Mm -hmm. You know, what about a recovery side? recovery definitely like do more of it like um i was like i said i was lucky in the recovery aspect because i was a stay-at-home dad so they had the i had the ability to to recover you know and over a long period of time or i didn't have to work as hard as people that work in warehouses or fucking sling mud or you know outside in the heat all the mm -hmm. time and shit like that so just take every moment that you can you know if um, whenever you're not training or even during training, like active recovery, if that's still a thing, like I still, I still consider it a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can take naps, take them. I know a lot of people can't, you know, because they do work a lot. Um, or try to go to bed earlier, you know, cause if, um, you don't have to stay up till 10 or 11 o'clock every night, you know, you don't have to stay up to watch your TV programs. You know, you can, you, if you've got like the DVRs record the shit or most of the shit is online mm -hmm. now anyways, so you can, you can catch up here and there, but take every opportunity you can to take, takes a nap, get better sleep, you know, fucking. And I say this oddly because I, I have a CPAP, but I don't use a CPAP because I fucking sleep face down and it's f so fucking hard <laughs> to use. But if you, if you use a, find out if you've got a sleep apnea, if that might be a reason you're not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. You know, find it, talk to other people that are, have had these issues, talk to people about their recovery and how it works for them. You know, for me, like the, my best, the best thing that works for me is just taking naps. If I can, mm -hmm. that that's what came in handy the most was just taking naps. What about the mental side? Mental, um, you're going to have to, mentality is that you're going to have to understand that eventually, and I, I know I've, I heard somebody say this is bad advice. But if you're doing this, eventually something's going to, you're going to get hurt. It's going to hurt, you know? And I heard Dave Hoff talk about this. It fucking hurts, you know? We're pushing the envelope. We're trying to get as strong as possible. We're trying to push as much weight as we can. It's going to fucking hurt. Something's going to hurt. Uh, so you have to understand that you have to be mentally prepared to take the pain, understand that it's going to hurt, and push through it, you know? But there's a difference also between being injured and hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it hurts... You know, you could probably work around it and still work through it. If you're injured, then that's completely different. That's whenever you have to have, like, something needs to be addressed. How did you know the difference between the two? The reason I knew it is because it messed with my ability outside of the gym as well. Not just in the gym, but outside. So it, it so in the gym, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. But outside, it affected my ability to interact with my kids. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, like, for my back injury, I couldn't, um, obviously, I couldn't get on the floor and play with my daughter. Um, I couldn't go for walks with her, you know, it, it, I couldn't lay in bed with her and read a story because everything hurt. Like I had to be in certain positions to actually not be in pain. So whenever it got to that point where it changed my ability to interact with my children or my wife or my family, that's whenever I knew it was, it was an injury and this is something that needed to be addressed and it wasn't just something that I could just work around. Yeah. So when you're working around or training through something, <clears throat> <laughs> How am I going to say this? Because you just, just change positions to do something that doesn't hurt. Yeah. Um, how are you able to navigate that aspect? So it's, I'm trying to think, say it's a bench and it's your shoulder. Maybe you talk a little bit more, your shoulder doesn't hurt. But at the same time, you know, there's some underlying issue yeah. that you're kind of working around. Mm -hmm. So 
myself in the younger my younger days it's like i never even bothered about it i just mm -hmm. whatever it doesn't hurt when i do this right. so i just keep going yep. and not address that underlying thing is you got older it's like okay i can do this but i still have to address this right. um would you say that's the same thing for yourself yeah because uh, and there was at times like whenever um like i would just change angles for mm -hmm. bench press like i get really bad bicep tendonitis so i found that if i just raise the bench like a little bit like i would put like a 25 under it and just change the angle a little bit it would take pressure off of that bicep tendon so i would go a few weeks of just doing that you know this is before i was a power or mm -hmm. power lifting too like it was just a lot of dumbbell work but i would change just the angle of it just to work around the pain um but yeah it got to the point where even as a power lifter um if certain things hurt like um shit trying to think it's like something that hurt so bad that i would just work and do something else oh my bicepial tendon is uh pack yeah it was for one like my pecs are really tight so it rolls mm -hmm. in so that that thing is getting pinched all the time um so that these are other things these are other things that i learned through our over the years mm -hmm. again like it's not something that i i didn't understand it at the time i just fucking i just worked through it you know, I'm like, it's going to fucking hurt. So let's just deal with it. Um, I went through that a lot. That was just basically the way I was raised, you know, military brat. Mm -hmm. Dad's, my dad was a drill instructor. He's like, you're going to, it's going to fucking hurt. Just suck it up. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember once in playing high school football, I got a knee in the ribs. I'm pretty sure I cracked a rib or two and I was in so much pain. It hurt to breathe and everything. And I put on one of those stupid fucking flak jackets that quarterbacks would wear mm -hmm. just for an extra protection. And I remember, uh, I remember like, god fuck, i hope my dad doesn't watch this mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh i remember like I, like i was basically told uh that i was being a sissy you know for wearing the flat jacket or like it was or maybe it wasn't so much what he said as just like his body language mm -hmm. so like i knew it wasn't something i should be doing like i shouldn't just embrace the pain and work through it so that was kind of the way i was raised you know if it, it's gonna hurt if it's gonna hurt then you suck it up and you keep moving forward mm -hmm. so that's that was the mentality i took into powerlifting and it was the mental it was kind of the mentality that i you know and this is something else like i wanted to touch on i, you know, I mean i'll do it now if you don't mind mm -hmm. but like my my mental the reason that i've worked so hard in powerlifting is because i didn't work hard in high school the way i should have i was expected to play college football mm -hmm. I leaned on my athletic ability rather than my work ethic to play college football. Well, whenever I got to Texas, I realized that these guys are like a different fucking breed, you know, kind of like, like some of the players in like Nebraska and Ohio, mm -hmm. like a lot of these guys are just different. So I was still trying to rely on my athletic ability and didn't put in the work like these other guys were doing. And I realized in powerlifting, I wasn't going to let that happen. Mm -hmm. So like, that's one reason that I work, I have worked so hard and worked through and dealt with so many injuries is because I was not going to let my work ethic or my lack of working f keep me from achieving what I wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. So that's the mentality of it. You've got to have a goal. You've got to have an end game. You've got to have something to work towards and don't let any fucking thing hold you back from doing, it. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's, it's inevitable. There are things that are going to stop you. You know, but that that's if it's out of your control, then so to speak, then so be it. But if it's within your control to work through it and continue doing what you want to do, then you get better fucking do it. Well, I think the problem becomes is people not realizing what's in their control and what's with not. True. I mean, but like for instance, like I know, like whenever you're in your career, like you had bad shoulders, like mm -hmm. you tore your pecs and shit like that. So that was like that was really out of your control. That was, shit was just it just happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know you've talked a lot about like you don't like going to powerlifting meets because it it kills you that you can't do it anymore. For a while. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and that's because that was something that to me, mm -hmm. and it may, you may see it different, but that was out of your control. Mm -hmm. Like you still wanted to do it, but your fucking body wouldn't let you. Mm -hmm. Like it, it failed you, so to speak. Um, and like I, I'm, feel like i'm getting to that point in my career after all these years that my body it doesn't want me to do what i want it to do mm -hmm. so that is it's i i'm trying to come to terms that it's kind of like getting out of my control yeah like i can still do it 
but I can't do it to the level that I want to do it, you know? So, so how do you play that mental game? It's hard. I mean, I, and it's something I'm having to deal with um, because there's still for le- like, in, there's something still in the basement, you know, the quote, the Rocky mm-hmm. movie. So like, I still want really badly to do this. I guess I may not be competitive, you know, against everybody, but I still want to compete with everybody. There's still things I want to do. Um, so, I, and I, I always think about, I was talking to Jim Grandick once at one of the XPC meets, and this was back when Rick was, Rick Hussey, I think when Rick was still alive, or maybe it just passed. But um, Jim was talking to Rick about competing in Masters, and Rick told him he, was fuck, he wasn't fucking allowed to do that until he was no longer competitive in Open. And Jim's like, when, when, when will that be? And I think Rick, if, you know, if I remember right, Rick told him, I'll tell you when that time is. Mm-hmm. So like, that's why I still do open. Like, I don't, I don't do a different category. I don't lift as a master. I, I still lift an open because I still want to be competitive against these younger people. Mm-hmm. And for the, for the most part in squat, I am like, I, I love to squat. It's the thing I've always loved to do. It's what I've been good at. Um, so I'm still competitive in that aspect. Like, I, I don't know, I probably will never reach the 1,100 pounds like I wanted to. Um, but, I mean, shit, I was still setting PRs, you know, I, I, I was in my 47 and 48, I was still hitting squat PRs. Mm-hmm. So I know I'm still capable of it. Um, but bench press, because of my shoulders and my fucking elbow, like, I know I'm never, probably never going to bench 700 unless I use one of these rubber band shirts, mm-hmm. you know. And then to me, like, granted, it's still the weight, but it's not the same. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to be able to bench 700 in a poly shirt like we used all these mm-hmm. other years. Um, and I know that right now deadlift is never going to be the way that I want it to because I'm, I mean, fuck, I can barely pull 400 pounds now. We can't figure it out why. So, yeah, mentally, I'm really struggling with that. And Danny and I talk about it a lot. And so do Tommy, Tommy Arnold that owns Storm. Like she and I talk about it a lot, too, because there she still wants to do things, you know, and she's like, I'm not sure. Okay, she's like 59. Mm -hmm. So like, she's still, she's struggling mentally with things that she wants to do, but isn't able to do things the way she wants to right now. And so like, yeah, I'm struggling with it mentally. I mean, I'm trying to wrap my head around it, trying to come to terms, uh, like maybe, maybe I should just lift at masters because then like, I've got different expectations. Like there's different, there's masters records that I can shoot for, you know, like right now, I think the heaviest master squat uh, was like Carl Gillingham. I think he squatted a thousand three in my age group and my weight. And I'm like, fuck, I can squat mm. that. It's so like, maybe I use that as a goal to continue having motivation and discipline, you know, something to drive me to continue to do better. So I guess the mental aspect of it is that I have to change what I'm shooting for. When, when you think back on 30 years close to yeah. <laughs> of all this, the, the biggest weights you've lifted there's you have weights that you lifted in the gym then you have weights that you lifted in a meet mm-hmm. and i understand it don't count unless you do it in a meet so right. from that same mentality but setting that aside for a moment when you think back and uh, the way i like to frame this is you know i was always told you know on your deathbed you're not gonna be thinking about squatting True. and all this other shit and i've been close to that before yeah. and you know what i was thinking about mm. fucking squatting were you really <laughs> yeah so i mean you you know it's because it's not just that i'm thinking of my family and kids yeah you, there's, I know. there's a lot of memory you don't you're not singly focused on one thing true right it's like i may not come out of this one so right. you know that's what i'm thinking about so it's it's there mm-hmm. right anytime you've gone under surgery it's always a risk yeah. right and so you're content you're thinking you know training there's there's things that are in there yeah so when you look back on those big weights would you say big weights Mm -hmm. which ones resonate in your memory more the ones that were in a meet or the ones that you did in a gym i think the ones that i did at the meet resonate more um and i'll tell you the reason the one of the main ones that i there's like two ones that i remember the most Mm -hmm. uh the first one was the whenever i squatted a grand for the first time after having my lower back surgery simply because people told me that i wasn't going to be able to do it again Mm -hmm. so i I squatted a grand at relentless detroit two within two years after my lower back surgery um i I did it in front of donnie thompson um which was cool uh because you know donnie being who donnie is like i thought it was cool to be able to do that so to me that was me again proving somebody wrong telling me i can't do that Mm -hmm. so that resonates and the second one 
is whenever I squatted 1,019, um, which I set a PR, and it was whenever I was dealing with so much SI joint pain. So I was in a, it was this meat, like I couldn't finish the meat without, I had to do a token deadlift because I was in so much pain. But after I squatted the 1,019, um, I was in so much pain that I, I fell forward and I rested my head on Joel Kennedy, who was the head judge, because, and I, ne- I had to use him to hold me up. And whenever I came off the platform, my daughter was waiting for me and she gave me a hug. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the, to me, that's the, I'll always remember that because she was there to help me mm-hmm. and support me. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's something that I remember. And I'll, it'll be the highlight of my career is having my girls there to support me and cheer for me and be involved. You know, maybe not, they don't, they don't do the training, but they're, they're always there to help me and go to meets with me and support me. Mm-hmm. So that one resonates the most was that one. What drives you now? Um, a lot of things to me, like for one, doing things that, again, and I don't know why this bothers me so much, but doing things people say I shouldn't be able to do. Um, I, I always want to prove people wrong. You know, whenever they say, oh, you shouldn't be doing this or you can't do this because, oh, you're 50. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's shit that people bring up all the time is my age, you know. Um, that um the fact that i am a competitive person and like if i don't compete i don't know i don't know what else to do Mm -hmm. you know i'm trying to find other things that i could be competitive at like and i tried competitive shooting like i did like two or three competitions there but that's fucking expensive man Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) fucking the ammo you go through and the entry fees and the it's so like i I, there might be something i explore still but um it's it's not the same you know, the reason that, that this sport is so important to me and always will be is the camaraderie of all of the people that I've met, you know, people like yourself, um, fuck, like guys that I, like I've, I've watched and like the guys that have mentioned me on this, on this table talk, you know, uh, Trevor Jaffe, Jordan Wong, these guys are like, I consider friends. I've known them for a long time. You know, I've seen them have kids and grow up, you know, shit like that. So without camaraderie in this sport, these people are what keep me in this sport. Mm -hmm. I love these people and I love the sport and I love what it means. You know, like we're always supportive of one another. We share equipment with one another. Like you show up to a meet and you've got your fucking belt. Someone is, there's always going to be like, someone's going to give you a belt to use. Mm -hmm. You know, it's never like, oh, it's all me. Like, you know, everybody, we're all supportive of one another, even though we're competing against one another, we want everyone to do well. Mm -hmm. So that, that keeps me motivated and keeps me driven. Um, Just being able to be around people and still train and be competitive. And uh, like, I still feel there's records, well, records that I can beat or that I can set, you know, obviously not in the open because these fuckers are really strong, but you know, master's records. And they, and I, and I, I know that people don't always put a lot of, um, what's the word? Respect for master's records. Like, oh, it's master's, you know? And I think like, I remember like you and Jordan were talking about some like master's, like, I don't want to be that guy that's just holding on, mm-hmm. you know? I don't like, I don't want to be that guy. Always oh, just holding on. Like he's just, you know, barely doing this. I don't want to be that. But I mean, if these are records that I can shoot for that keep me driven, keep me involved, keep me motivated, then I'm going to keep doing it because I still want to do this sport, Mm -hmm. you know? So that's my mental. That's what keeps me driven, you know, at that. Have you been able to navigate the the online world, right? Because you had a training log on our site before Facebook and Instagram and all that existed, Mm -hmm. right? And then things evolved, you know, over a period of time to where the social media world comes. Um, myself personally, I think I was better prepared for that because I already saw all the stupid criticism through the Q and a, yeah. you know, and the training logs and stuff like that. So it, it the online drama or whatever you want to call it yeah. never really sucked me in because they didn't really give a shit. Well, like outlaw, you remember outlaw? Yeah. I mean, there yeah. was that, yeah. you know, and that some people had a hard time dealing with stuff through that. Other ones didn't, I yeah. really didn't give a shit, you know, and I, I've had, I'm not going to say like the, um, the criticism hasn't bothered me at times. Uh, like I just recently, like, uh, people talking shit on my Instagram about my depth. Mm-hmm. Like whenever a lead FTS, like reposts one of my training, like there'll be people that obviously they don't know me. They don't mm-hmm. know how long I've been in this sport and shit. And they're like, Oh, you know, 
Santa Claus is strong, but he mm-hmm. really needs to work on his depth. Mm-hmm. Like, fucking guy, guys, come on. I've been doing this shit for 27 years. I know what depth is. You know, it, it fucking hurts to get down there sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I made it a point. The next two videos that I posted, I was fucking hitting depth just to prove that I can do it. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I just don't fucking want to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, yeah. I mean, outlaws, all that shit. I guess it, it prepared me more for it because I was catching shit, you know, that the uh, that Lex and Pro-Am that I did, like my 970 squat was obviously high. I knew it was high. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to fucking not take it. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember my 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 uh, handler, he called me up, but he couldn't fucking see where I was because there were so many spotters. So if he couldn't see me, I know good and well the fucking judges couldn't see me. Mm-hmm. So I went down until I heard up and I fucking stood up, got white lights. I'm like, okay, fuck, cool. I'm going to mm-hmm. take it. At the time, that was the 17th best squat at 242 at my body weight. So I was in the top 20 all time. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't going to be like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I looked at the video. I didn't get there. Yeah. So I'm not going to fucking take it. So yeah, it was, it was probably an inch high, inch and a half. So, so yeah, I caught shit from that. Like there was a guy, the people's champ. Can't remember what his real name was, but like he called me out for it and shit like that. So yeah, I've, I've had to deal with it over these years because it, before we had Instagram and all that shit, there were still all these forums mm-hmm. that people would talk shit on. And most of the time I don't let it bother me. And this is something like I talked with Anthony Oliveira about is like, uh, you can't let it fuck with you. You can't let it bother you because I mean, who the fuck cares? Yeah. You know, you just do what you do and you keep moving forward. And that's what I tell everybody else. I was like, listen, I've been dealing with this shit a long time. It does. It's not going to help you to let this shit get to you. Yeah. If anything, it's just going to fuck with your head. Well, I think they should ask themselves when you see it or when you see it, you know, if you just pause for a minute and ask yourself, why does this bother me? Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what ask Anthony yourself said. that, yeah. you know, and then, you and, know, maybe there's some truth to it. Yeah. Maybe there's not. There's yeah. a reason why it bothers you. Right. You and know, it does. So, yeah. Like, and like, I try not to let it bother me and I try to listen to I should listen to my own advice, mm-hmm. but there are sometimes like, they'll say the right thing and it'll just fucking irk me mm-hmm. and it'll bother me for a few days. And then, and then like, normally I get over it, you know, but they're right. As far as they, they, the, the depth thing is that mm-hmm. like you should train to the point where you need to be in a meet. But sometimes my fucking hips just don't want to work mm-hmm. or like my side joint hurts or something. There's something that's hindering me from getting to where I need to be. Well, there's, there's that, there's that direct criticism, but then there's just the overall drama that will follow, God, yes. you know, throughout the sport Yeah, and, and being able to and navigate. First off, it's, it's, it's interesting to me because, you know, some bodybuilders may leave bodybuilding and start powerlifting and they leave bodybuilding because they're just sick of all the bullshit drama. Yeah. And then they're like, well, wait a minute. It's here too. Yeah. Like, dude, it's everywhere. It, it doesn't matter what you do. It's always there. It's how you navigate it. Yeah. Kind of move through it. Well, there's, there's still the, the raw versus gear thing. You know, that shit's been going on for years and it's still going on. Is it really though? And this is why I ask because you've been in gyms with a large number of lifters mm-hmm. and you've competed in meets with different demographics of yeah. lifters and all the other kind of stuff. I don't see it there. In the gym, no. Online, yeah. I still see I it. I don't see it in meets either. No. You know, so if it's a meet with raw and multiply, yeah. I don't see it there. Not at all. The only place I see it is online. Yep. So to me, that's fake. Yeah. It's not real. That's true. And most of the time, it's people like you've never fucking heard of anyway. Yes. You know, like, like Dan, Dan Bell, Shane Holler, these guys, like they're, they're raw guys, but they don't talk shit to us as mm-hmm. shit about wearing gear. Well, Dan Bell does sometimes, but that's just Dan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I still, I'm like, well, like you, you may out squat me raw, but I still out bench you in gear. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> not that that means much to him, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, normally if, if there's any kind of back and forth or shit talking, it's in just good fun. Mm-hmm. But these, you know, I train. Like whenever I got to Storm or Perfect Storm, like there was only like three of us that trained in gear, and it was me and Danny and Tommy. Everybody else, they're all raw lifters. Mm-hmm. So it was it was weird going from CTX where everybody was in gear except for like two guys to a gym where there was like just three of us in gear and everybody else was raw. But we all worked well together. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody gave a shit, nobody criticized or anything like that because we all wanted everybody to get better. We all want everybody to get stronger. So like, yeah, you're right. In the gym, it's not really there or it meets. It's not really yeah. there. It's just online. Well, I call it, there's the real world and there's the fake world. True. I'd rather live in the real world. Yeah. Real world. Right. <laughs> because that's where you interact with people yeah. day to day. Yep. And you know, online is things are just over amplified. Definitely. You know, and, <clears throat> but it's not real mm-hmm. because those 
first off, you don't know who half the people even are. Not at all. Right. And um, they're not vocal in person. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if is it, is it really a problem? Right. They're not going to say that, say that shit to you to meet. No. You know, so it's not really a problem. Yeah. You know, so, and it's not even the same people. No. Right. Cause well, yeah, it's, it's like I said, like it's, it's people that are, I get criticized by people. I have been criticized by people. I don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, it may, may, it might make more of a difference to me if I did, you know, if I did know if it came from somebody that I respected, then that's something, you know, I take to heart. I'm like, well, maybe they're right. Yeah. But those people aren't going to post a comment. No, if anything, you know, they'll, they'll send you a message, send you like a, message. A, a DM or call yeah. you or text you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's mostly it's mostly people that that you don't know. They're just trolls trying to get a rise out of you, trying to start some shit. Mm -hmm. So if they do, they win. Yeah, exactly. And that's again, that's what Anthony and I talked about. Mm -hmm. If you if you bite, then they've won. They've gotten the response from you that they they were trying to get. So they've beat. Mm -hmm. So don't let them beat. Oh, exactly. It's, it's, like I said, it's not the real world. No, not even no, close. And it's it's so obvious, right? But it's it may not be obvious to those people that are training alone. Yeah, you know, then they think that's what powerlifting is, mm -hmm. and it's not. Right. You know, because they're not around other people to be able to see how great the sport really is. Definitely. Right. Where there's like a false divide. I mm -hmm. guess it's in every aspect of society anymore. Yeah. So it's just kind of the way it plays out. The training. So going to the you you noted the lifts that you remember the most mm -hmm. what are some of the gym stories that you remember the most that you're comfortable speaking about because <laughs> that becomes a different you know everybody likes the gym stories but i i'll just put a preface out there that a lot of the reason people won't tell the fucked up gym stories is because the other person involved isn't sitting right there yeah. and it's not really the best thing in the whole world to do with the really fucking good ones yeah um, but outside of that there are always some things you can share the the one that stands out the most, and I was just talking to Sheena about this earlier because we were talking about me being a caffeine addict and I fucking love pre-workout and shit like that, is uh, at CTX, there was one day where we didn't have pre-workout, but someone happened to have some Adderall. So they're like, hey, you want to try some Adderall? I'm like, fuck yeah. I was like, is, is it work? And they're like, yeah, it should work. So me and uh, Alan decided to take Adderall at the same time. Uh, well... By the end of the day, Danny told us that he and I were not allowed to take Adderall together anymore because we wouldn't shut the fuck up. We talked the entire time. And it wasn't even about, it was just about random shit. Mm -hmm. It was babbling here and there, back and forth. Um, so that one stands out the most is just the stupid shit that we would do. But like other, God, I don't know, man. It's been so long. There's so many gems. Fuck. What about um, <laughs> impressive things that you've seen, like in gym, feats of strength, weights lifted? Let's see. At OBB, we uh, let's see. We had Gary Frank show up one day, so just watching him deadlift was entertaining. I mean, there was. I remember there was one meet that we went to in Baton Rouge. It was the AAPF Nationals, and Gary and his crew were training at night at this at this thing uh and like we decided as a group that we we're gonna sit there we're gonna watch gary frank train and like one of the main things we noticed is how big gary was and like gary was holding like a regular size mountain dew can and it looked like one of those fucking mini cans mm -hmm. that they have now because of how big gary was so that was funny uh just watching that but what stood out the most is like they would like gary would do a set and then they'd all walk over as a group and sit down and they'd sit there for like 20 minutes and then they'd all get up, go back to the monolift <laughs> and do like another set. And then they'd all walk over and sit down. So about after half an hour of this, we decided to leave. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was, God, there was another big deadlift guy that came to train at OBB once. And like, he was pulling like 800 pounds for repetitions. But I would say most recently is watching Dan Bell squat. Um, and just his ability to move that heavy weight as fast as he does. Like he starts at like four or 500 pounds on the bar. Like he doesn't, he, he doesn't do much as far as like mobility work or stretching or warm ups and shit. Like he'll just fucking put those 50 kilo plates on and then, you know, walk it out and squat down with it and stand up like it's nothing. Um, so like being able to spot that dude 
just his ability to handle the weight like it's nothing what a deadlift too like it just flies off the floor and uh most recently we've had uh fernando arias i think i said his last name right but he's training at storm now too and i was fucking with him one day because we were deadlifting next to one another and i uh, being a smart ass i'm like hey dude i was like i'll try not to embarrass you today Mm -hmm. and he just he like chuckles a little bit like (laughs) like fuck so (laughs) this kid like he uh he he was done pulling by the time like i got to like and I, I had already started, but he was done pulling by the time I got halfway through because he was jumping like red plate after red plate after red plate. So like he went from like one red plate to like 800 pounds in like 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. And still the kid, and I call him a kid because he's in his 20s, uh, but he's just, he pulls a weight with like no effort, you know? And it's so impressive to watch because of how much struggle I'm having in a deadlift. And then I watch people like himself or Dan or even Danny Tenero like watching them pull weight off the floor with no effort in the speed, mm-hmm. you know? So, so yeah, watching Fern, Fern pull is, is, is impressive to me, but like, I don't, I, I don't, I can't think of like really weird yeah. gym stories. I mean, I, I've got some stories about us doing like, we call whiskey and deadlifts. Um, but th- that involves like people doing some drunk, stupid shit. Mm-hmm. So like, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want to out them on shit like that, but like we we do those like every so often in celebration of things. So we'll have uh, whiskey and deadlifts, and it, it normally involves uh, some people getting down to like their underwear, mm-hmm. and they're just walking around the gym in their fucking underwear. So it and they're still training. Just like how that. does the how does this involve le- losing clothes? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really I don't know how it happens, but there's like one guy in in particular. Uh, and I love him to death, but it never fails. Like the shirt comes off and then next thing you know, it's the gym shorts and he's just walking around in his fucking like under armor skivvies still training, you know? And I just think it's like, for one, he sweats a lot. Like most of the big guys do, but like the alcohol, like it, it, uh, your, your inhibitions aren't there anymore. So you mm-hmm. don't fucking care. So like you say things and do things and touch people, you know, the way that you really wouldn't normally. So, yeah, so those are entertaining. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want. <laughs> How frequently do those come around? Uh, not as often as we probably like. <laughs> <laughs> like, we just had one recently because uh, one of my buddies, Joao, is uh, leaving to go to Holland to be a chiropractor overseas. And he's been at Storm since day one, from what I understand. Uh, he's sponsored by Storm. You know, he's good friends with Tommy and Gary. And uh, so he's going overseas, so we're all going to miss him. So we had a whiskey and deadlift. And uh, Joao, Joao is one that can put away some whiskey. So normally what happens is like you'll have a, like they'll go a deadlift. And then everybody walks over to the other side and takes a fucking shot. Mm-hmm. And then they come back to the other side and pull some more. And then they'll go back and take another shot. So I've lost count at how many shots sometimes they do, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, like some people can handle the whiskey better and then some others don't. <laughs> And those are the ones that are, that are normally like being very obnoxious and loud and boisterous. And normally I'm, I try to leave before all of that happens because mm-hmm. I, I don't drink. I might take a shot or two with them, but I, I can't, I can't tolerate mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the obnoxiousness. So I like, I normally leave before it gets out of hand because <laughs> like, I, I know people in certain ways and there's other ways I don't want to see them behave. Mm-hmm. So I, I leave before that shit happens. <laughs> So I, I, so that's why I don't have a lot of crazy gym stories is just simply because I, uh, I, I normally do what I got to do and then I fucking leave, Mm -hmm. you know, most of, most of the stories that I have are things that have happened outside of the gym. Like whenever we're hanging out together later, Mm -hmm. like, uh, at OBB, we used to go to Frogger's after benching and fucking one night there was this dude talking shit, staring and ended up talking shit to Schwab. And then we had this other dude. Uh, Derek, who uh, basically was not afraid to throw fists, and he confronted the dude, and the dude went outside and came back in and like pulled a knife. <laughs> like so, like he's standing there with a knife, like talking shit, and like Derek and Schwab are like, like Derek or Schwab's trying to back Derek down, you know, trying to get him because the dude's holding a knife. So just stupid shit like that, mm-hmm. you know. So it always seems to happen outside of the gym, yeah. You know, whenever we're out, because again, you know people see big guys and they're like, Oh, I want to start a fight. I want mm-hmm. to talk shit, you know? And it always ends up happening. It's like alcohol is normally the one that, that starts that. 
yeah. you know, because people get drunk and start saying shit they shouldn't. So, yeah. So <laughs> unfortunately, even though I've been doing this for so long, I don't have a lot of gym yeah. stories. How have you had to change your training as, as you've gotten older? Big, the big things that you've had to change. Um, the big thing is I, I've had to learn to back off because uh to find that more to listen to my body more so like if it hurts then fucking find something else to do like some days some days it's just not worth it and i, I found that out on like squat days uh, like i'd show up and i'd get to like 400 and like nothing felt right my warm-ups didn't go well like everything hurts so i had to learn to put the ego aside and uh pack it in for the day, do something else, you know, do some, do hack squats, leg presses, something, do the belt squat. That was, mm -hmm. that was something that really came in handy is a fucking belt squat. Mm -hmm. Cause, um, I'm able to do belt squats and my SI joint doesn't hurt. So I, we had one like a makeshift one at CTX and we had one at OBB. And then whenever, um, Whenever I got to Storm, we've got two of them, and we've got an Elite FTS belt mm -hmm. squat. I fucking love that thing. It, How do you use it? Uh, more repetition stuff, uh, but there I do go. I do go heavy, and I I <laughs> I have fun on it too because I'll 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 go conjugate as fuck. Mm -hmm. So like I'll hand I'll put fucking bands on it and chains, and then like I'll hang chains from my fucking belt, just having fun, mm -hmm. you know. So I'll use it as as a as a rpe or max effort day too you know so i'll use it just depending on what I, what i need to do that day so like if i'm supposed to squat heavy but i can't then i'll try to do heavy on the belt squat mm -hmm. so I, I will like if i'm supposed to do chains then i fucking do chains on the belt squat so i'll load the chains on and then i'll just start adding weight till i get try to get to the same percentage that i'm supposed to be at with the bar but i do it on the belt squat <laughs> Um, it saves my SI joint. I'm still able to get work in. I'm still able to use my legs and shit like that, like I'm supposed to. Um, with briefs or not? Uh, I've done it with briefs. Yeah. Um, I, I would try not not so much really tight briefs, but I've actually used knee wraps on it too. Um, not like the heavy duty. I know it's fucking weird. No, I was just trying to like, <laughs> that would suck because you got you to gotta put the belt on. Yeah. Right? So, so you got to squat down and well, put the belt on. I would use... Not the hardcore mm -hmm. knee wraps. I'd use some like old, I've got these old Titan mm -hmm. knee wraps that have been around probably for like 17 years and they're stretched to fucking shit, but mm -hmm. I can get a lot of revolutions out of it. So yeah. more, they're more supported than knee sleeves. So yeah, it's a, it's a pain in the ass, but I still do it um, just because I, I feel like sometimes it's necessary, Yeah, you know, for me to do what I need to do. But then there are times also like now, like, um, we're trying to work on knee forward movement for my deadlift because a lot I've been uh, for so long, like we're taught in gear that we sit back, sit back on your heels as you pull. Um, so me doing that now really aggravates my SI joint because it puts so much pressure on that. So now Danny's trying to teach me to be a little bit more knees forward over the bar so that I'm using more quad leg drive to stand up with it. Uh, which is really difficult for me to learn because of all the years I've spent sitting mm -hmm. back into the gear. Uh, so we're, we're using the belt squat. So I'll, I'll stand further back. And as I squat down, I'll let it pull my knees forward mm -hmm. to use that to learn that it's able to do it and not to be afraid of it happening and actually develop that ability or those, that quad strength to do it. Mm -hmm. um, some days it helps. Like there, there are days where I pull and I'm like, it, it fucking clicks, it works. But more often than not, like I, I revert immediately, especially as the weight gets heavier, I revert to sitting back on my heels and like my legs are perpendicular to the mm -hmm. floor. So we're using that to help keep, learn that knee travel and keeping the knees forward. My list of oddball questions. <laughs> Here we go. So, and see, I was worried what we were going to talk about. All right. What music do you listen to? Huh. Um, fuck, this thing keeps burning out on me. Uh, my favorite uh, to listen to is Amon Amarth. What the fuck is that? It is, uh, I see <laughs> Owen. Owen's over there nodding. It's a uh, Viking metal. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of the stuff that they sing about is it, it's heavy metal, but it, they sing about Thor and Odin. And 
battles and war and shit like mm-hmm. that. So that's that's what I sh- that I I love to listen to that stuff. Uh, not too many people appreciate it in the gym. So every once in a while, I try to sneak it in. What about outside of the gym? Outs- funny enough, like I've been listening to a lot of country music lately, mm-hmm. uh, because it's it to me, it's relaxing, you know. Granted, country music is still the same shit now. Like it's still like it just like I grew up listening to Waylon Jennings mm-hmm. and Willie Nelson and like Johnny Cash and shit like that with my dad. And like they they always sing about, you know, your dog dying, your truck broke, you know, your girlfriend left you, your wife left you, and shit like that. And then like it's the same, they're still singing about the same shit. So like nothing's really changed. It's just different people singing it. And now country's become a lot more poppy. Mm-hmm. You know, like the the music. Uh, the the background music is more it's not all guitar and piano and you know shit like that like it's a lot of electrical shit and poppy like beats and stuff like that so um funny enough i actually like to li- like hip hop i don't know if you've heard of that yeah yeah, Roll, yeah 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 bubba sparks yeah, yeah so i like uh for some odd thing enough i actually like listening to that shit too mm-hmm. some of it's funny um then you've got like guys like adam calhoun um, who's like kind of like a, a right leaning conservative. Mm-hmm. Like he sings about a lot of shit that I that I I relate to and I like. So yeah, outside of the gym, it's it's I don't know. It's like I listen to a whole lot of shit, and most of it that my wife doesn't appreciate. Like mm-hmm. she won't listen to it in the truck with me. Like normally, if we're in the truck together, it's always eighties. Like we're always listening to eighties music, and fucking Michael Jackson and Cindy Lauper and fucking shit like that, because that's what we grew up on. Um. But yeah, but that's well, did you though, right? Because it's I grew up with a lot of that shit, but I didn't listen to that. I was listening to other things. <sighs> what well, I did, yeah, because like, I was born in seventy three, so like I spent a lot of like I think eighty six through eighty nine. I was in Germany, so it was like that's all that they that we got was like pop shit, mm-hmm. like eighties. So like there was also like there was Run DMC, um, what do you call it? fucking two live crew shit like that, that that i grew up listening to but it was always it was like 80s pops yeah stuff. but that's not cindy lopper no but <laughs> <laughs> you see what i'm talking about I, you're listening to like Debo and cindy lopper yeah uh, meanwhile you were listening to you know quiet riot quiet riot acd shit like acdc that, yeah. like i've mentioned Twisted sister yeah. shit like that like the acdc is my favorite band and i know that a lot of people will say that but like i i can't never go wrong listening to ADC, mm. acdc it gets me fucking pumped up mm-hmm. no matter what you know although like a lot of it is played out and a lot of people will say that yes that plays it a lot but you still it put it on in any gym it works no shit just like metallica <laughs> like old school metallica fucking mm-hmm. love old school metallica mm-hmm. you know i'm not keen on the on the newer stuff uh, you know, it just, it's not the same. What's the last thing you binge watched? <laughs> I've been, uh, Rookie. The Rookie. Rookie? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, um, Big Bang Theory. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, Young Sheldon. All right, well, I'm asking this because when you have surgeries, yeah. right? <laughs> I know how this works, right? You get to a point where you run out of shit. Uh, it's funny that you bring this up because <laughs> we just talked about this at the gym. Every surgery that I've had, I will sit home and I will watch nothing but Kung Fu movies. Oh God. I will watch old school Mm -hmm. Kung Fu movies where like they dubbed over and like they would use their fucking hair as weapons, you know, and they're sailing through the air (laughs) with fucking swords, um, to the new stuff with like Donnie, uh, Donnie Yen, who's like one of my favorite action, uh, like martial arts people. Uh, so I I'll watch him and like Ip Man where he's recreating like, uh, Bruce Lee's, uh, sensei. Um, so I, I love Kung Fu movies, dude. <laughs> and I, and like, and it, and it spirals into like John wick is like one of my favorite things mm-hmm. to watch. I fucking love the John wick movies. So like, I'll watch things like that. And that's like all I'll watch. And my, my wife will come home and I'm sitting here watching, you know, hi ya, which is like, yeah. a, so like I watch that and she's like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like you wouldn't believe how many Kung Fu movies there are. Yeah. You know, there's so many cool shit, cool movies out there. And there are some of them that will spin into like a romance thing. And like, I'm like, I picked the wrong fucking one today. Yeah, so yeah. like, I'll, I'll turn it off and try to find another one. But yeah, every surgery I've had, it's always Kung Fu movies. Kung Fu movies. So thank goodness for Netflix. Well, it's shit. not baking shows though. No, that's my <laughs> wife, dude. My wife loves uh, Top Chef, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So like, I, I watch that a lot to appease her. And the thing is like, there are times where I actually get involved mm-hmm. and I'm like, who, who got, who got cut today? 
like, oh shit, he was doing so well. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? Who, what am I? Who am I? Yeah. So I, I get, I get involved in that shit now too. I don't even pay attention because if Tracy's watching that, I, I'm, I'm watching. Yeah. But not I'm not involved. paying any fucking bit of attention <laughs> at all to even know what the fuck they're yeah. making. Well, she, I don't know how my brain does it because I'm, I'm physically looking yeah. at it. She, uh, she'll get mad at me because uh, like she'll look over and I'm on my phone. She's like, Joe, I'm like, what, what? She's like, you're supposed to be watching this with me. I'm like, I don't, I don't watch these baby. Mm -hmm. So like, I'll end up putting my phone away just for the simple, because yes, we're supposed to be spending time together. Yeah. And if I'm on my phone that we're not spending time together. So I understand where she's coming yeah. from. But at the same time, there's, there's times where I just, I don't get involved. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of times where they'll have people on there that I just irritate the fucking shit out of them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always crying about something or whining about something. And I'm like, I, I was like, I really hope they, they vote these people off real quick because mm -hmm. otherwise I can't watch this with you. Because there have been times where I've gotten up and left when she was watching stuff just because I couldn't stand the voice of the people mm -hmm. anymore that was on the TV show. Well, you guys have been married for what, 27 years? Yeah. We've been together for 30. Yeah. And we started dating in high school when we were 16. So how do you make this work? Together? Yeah, for this long. Um, uh it's weird that you would ask that. <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, I, I look through other powerlifters. I know I look through other people that I've known. Yeah, and it's 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 rare. It is anymore, and like and unfortunately, I know. And and, <laughs> and like we've talked about, I've talked about this with people before. Like a lot of my teammates on Elite FTS, a lot of them are not with the same person that they were before, or have had have been through a couple of marriages and stuff like that. And I guess the fact that my wife and I have been together as long as we have is because for one, I actually feel that she is my soulmate. Mm -hmm. You know, she's been nothing but supportive for me throughout everything. She's always been there for me whenever I needed her. Um, we come from a pretty much identical background. Like her father was in the army, served two tours in Nam, you know, was a chief warrant officer. So she lived the same life as I did having to move every two to four years, not really having childhood friends. So we understand each other in that aspect. So we understand like whenever we don't become attached to people, you know? So like she and I, even though we have friends, we don't really hang out with a lot of people. And I think it still stems from that military aspect of, mm -hmm. of how we were raised. So I, I, that, and the fact that I've been very supportive of her, like I've for like, for one, I mean, in high school, we talked about her becoming a doctor, which she is, she's a veterinarian. Um, she asked me back then if she became a, a doctor, would I have a problem being at home taking care of the kids, which is like role reversal, so to yeah. speak, in the in the stereotypical times. Or uh, so I was like, No, I don't have a problem. I was like, as long as we're putting food on the table and the kids are being taken care of, I was like, I don't care. You know? So uh so we've always had this connection to understanding one another, uh, to being supportive of one another's needs or like her desire to become a, a veterinarian which took her to because she couldn't get into school in stateside because it's so competitive to get into veterinarian schools because there's a limited number as opposed to medical schools. Mm -hmm. So like, even though she had a good GPA and she had volunteer hours and shit like that, she wasn't getting selected. So rather than continuously apply and wait and wait and wait, she applied at Ross university in St. Kitts and she got accepted. So she moved down there without me for the first six months, which was horrible because we ran up like a $700 phone bill to the point where I was working like three jobs trying to pay the phone mm -hmm. bill. And on top of that, um, her apartment got broken into one night whenever she was there. So she was asleep and they broke in through one of the side windows and like came into her room when she was there and like stole shit while mm -hmm. she was asleep. Um, and then the whole little nut thing I was talking to you about. So I was like, I'm fucking, I'm, I got to move down there. So like I, I took a leave of absence at first from my job, two jobs that I had, and I moved down there and just spent some time. And then they just happened to have an opening. So they, so I, you know, I worked down there, but I wanted her to achieve what she wanted to. Mm -hmm. So like, I was very supportive of her doing that. And I was willing to do whatever it took for me to do in order to make sure that she did that. Even if it meant me working at, at shitty jobs, like I was, I was working at Kmart as an operations manager. Mm -hmm. Fucking hated that job. <laughs> hated all the people that I worked with. I met some nice people that were employees, but like the, the, the managers, like there was this one dude, the first store manager I worked with, his name was Max. And this dude was a complete dick. 
Like he yelled at people. He'd throw temper tantrums and throw shit in the back. Like he would, he'd go into receiving and receiving. If like the overnight crew hadn't done what they would do, he'd fucking throw temper tantrums and throw shit. <laughs> so this was the, this was the environment that I was in, mm-hmm. you know, and I, but it was a job and it paid the bills. And then they, uh, they fucking went bankrupt. You know, so then I was a store manager at Seven Eleven because it fucking paid the bills, you know? So, like, I was willing to do whatever it took for her to get to where she needed to be. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, I would, to me, the fact that we supported each other as much as we have, we understand one another. I'm not going to say that we haven't had our differences, but it, it's, uh, it's always been something that we've been able to work through and understand with one another. So, like, yeah. So, that's, that's the reason that we've lasted this long. Mm-hmm. You know, we're still going strong. We still love one another. You know, we still spend time with them. We try to do date nights so that whenever we do, whenever the kids do leave the house, it's not like, you know, like other families, like the, whenever all you have in common are the kids, mm-hmm. you know, you got to, we, we go on date nights. So we have something in common, something together that keeps us involved with one another that we have together. And it's not just the kids yeah. that are, that we have in common. What are you going to do when they all are out of the house? I don't fucking know, Dave. I got, I but you got, got what, three years to figure this out? Yeah. And it, <laughs> my, that's what my, but my daughter, Nora, my youngest one, she talks about all the time. Like, she's like, I'm never leaving. And, you know, as much as I like to believe that it's not true, she's going to leave. Um, but it eats me alive. And like, I've actually reached out and talked to people that are empty nesters. And I'm like, how do you deal with it? You know, and it's, they're like, every one of them is like, it's tough at first, you know, especially the first year. Like, it, and like, I'm, I'm dealing with it a little bit whenever she's at school and I'm at home because I'm unemployed right now. So it's, it's fucking quiet. Mm -hmm. It's so quiet at home and there's only so much cleaning and tidying up and vacuuming that you can do to occupy your time. And then the rest of the time it's just quiet. Mm -hmm. And, um, like, I know that that's going to happen eventually, you know, hopefully I'll have a job by then, Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, coming home to an empty house, yeah, I'm not looking forward to that at all because my, my wife, my life has been these kids, mm-hmm. everything, like everything that I do, like at some point in time has just been for my children. You know, they've, what I work for, what I, you know, what I enter, what I interact with, stuff like that. So like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I really don't. I'm not looking forward to it. Well, maybe Kmart needs another operations manager. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, I don't even know if they're around. No, they're anymore. not. They're not. <laughs> like, I don't even think like Sears bought them. And like, K- I think there's like one Kmart left in the entire nation. Yeah. And I think it's in New York. But uh, like, Sears isn't even doing well. Like, Sears Roebuck mm-hmm. is fucking on bankruptcy. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. Like, it's, I, I, I'm not looking forward to it. Like, my oldest daughter lives in Virginia. I think I mentioned earlier. And I miss her dearly. Mm-hmm. Like she, uh, she's about, she's on the verge of getting married, which is something I'm having to deal with too. Like it's breaking my heart that she's, uh, that she's getting older and moving on and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, she's, uh, she comes down to visit as much as she can and vice versa. It's, uh, so yeah, so like we all, there always ends in tears whenever she goes back home and shit like that. My middle daughter moved out. She's in living with her boyfriend. So I get to see her more often, but not as often as I'd want to. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's hard. Well, when they're all out and your training's only really on the weekends, right? You just go stay with them during the week and don't right. tell them you're coming. <laughs> I'm sure they'll appreciate that. I, I did. <laughs> Dad showing up out of nowhere. I did that with my middle daughter. <laughs> I uh, I showed up unannounced, knocked mm-hmm. on the door. And she's like, "Oh, hi, Dad." I'm like, "Hey, honey, how you doing?" And like she stood in the doorway, and I'm like, "Can I come in?" She's like. No, there was things inside her apartment she didn't want me to see. Mm-hmm. So I was not allowed to come in. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, so do I need to call and announce myself that I'm coming over? I can't just surprise you. She's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, all right. I didn't realize that was what we'd come to, but okay. Yeah. So any topics you want to talk about that I didn't bring up? Um, I don't know, have we beat the record? I have no idea. Uh, no. No, if you're right in the middle. I don't, even know, I don't even know where we're at. Yeah. All right. Um, I think, um, I think like, I think I mentioned, like I wanted to, at first I wanted to talk about, I think we already touched on it was why I chose to work with Danny mm-hmm. and, um, you know, basically that revolved around like hold, I want to be held accountable and Danny's going to have me do things that I wouldn't do on my own and to get to make sure that I'm doing better or doing, being healthy and not just strong. Like he, uh, he trains you or he, pr- he programs you to not only be strong, but to be I guess com- 
capable outside of the gym too. Mm -hmm. So it's not just what you can do in the gym, but what your life is like outside of the gym. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, as you saw, like whenever you talked to him and he was on here, like he's very technical, very attentive to things. Like he's always on, he's always learning. Um, so that, that was one reason. That's the primary reason I chose to have Danny do my programming is because he's, he's always got the best interest of his clients at heart. And, uh, and since I've, I've known him since he was like 17 years old. So he's, he, I've known him since he was just a kid. So I, I know that he's going to do everything within his power or his ability to make me better mm -hmm. and keep me doing this as long as I want to. So, and I think the other thing I wanted to talk about was longevity in the sport. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I know there's been a lot of guys that, that come in, hit big numbers and then they're gone. And, uh, you know, and I, I've been around for a long time. Um, I've met and I know a lot of people and I love the fact that I do. So I, I just, if you want to do this sport for a long time, you have to be willing to learn from other people, accept that, um, that not everything is going to work the way you want it to. And, uh, like training wise. So I know you're going to like to expand on that. Like mm -hmm. just because I think we touched on it earlier, just because Shane Holler does this and it works for him does not mean it's going to work for you. Like, and I know you mentioned before, like squatting, like, I think you were talking to Jordan about squat technique. Mm -hmm. like people don't pay enough attention to their technique. So just because Shane squats one way doesn't mean that you should squat mm -hmm. this way. Just because I squat this way doesn't mean that, that Danny should squat that way. So everyone has a different ability or different technique that they need to find that works best for them. Granted, I mean, it, it's a lot of hit or miss. It's a lot of trial and error finding that. Um, so be willing to adapt, you know, be willing to change just something. Like every, just because one person told you this, how, this is how it's supposed to be done doesn't mean that's exactly how it should be done. What are some of the commonalities with that you see with the people that have been in the sport for a long time? So there is what you just said there, yeah. but if you, you know, kind of scour through your brain mm -hmm. and think of the people that have been in for two decades, what are some of the things that are similar with all them? I guess tenacity, hard headed, mm -hmm. you know, um, Dig into that a little like, bit more, because that could be a bad thing. Well, one guy that I think of mo most is a uh, Lloyd Bingham. Um, like he's a judge, and he's still lifting. He's got hip replacements and stuff like that, and he's still lifting. And uh, it, it's like tenacity, meaning like he's there's still love for the sport. Like he still he still loves doing it. So he's he's willing to work through the pain, um, accept that there are some things that he can't do, and still w move forward. Um, Paul Wallace, which is another guy that I've met. Um, I think, uh, what is his name? Big dude from down, forget his name, but he actually came up here and trained not too while back. But, uh, he's like, he's, he squatted, um, squatted a thousand pounds at 50 years old. It was like the first time he ever squatted a thousand or like 49. So guys like, like him, like there's, there's always something ahead of you. Like there should be always some kind of a goal in mind in order to keep you doing this sport for a long time, you know? Cause I mean, I've, I've been doing it so long because I love it. Mm -hmm. um, well, on the flip, on the flip side of this, we've seen this sport basically destroy people's lives. True. You know, so <clears throat> what are the common factors that you see in those people? I got a couple that I can bring up, but I'll let you go first. <laughs> Because it's 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 part of your identity, it's part of my identity, but it's 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 a balanced identity yeah. in some sort of fucked up way. Yeah. Uh, where with some of the other ones that I'm speaking about, it it becomes so over consuming. Yeah. Of everything that they do, that they think it needs to come faster. Yeah. Than what it should. They and push too hard, too yeah, fast. Yeah, that relentless push to try to get everything to come even faster. Yeah. Leads to, you know, bad training decisions. Yeah. Bad PED decisions, bad relationship Definitely. decisions, you know, all these other type of things. Yeah. And none of those things can be pushed mm -hmm. in that bad's probably the wrong way, wrong word. Um, 
Because at some point, all those things are going to be pushed beyond the capabilities of what you really should do, but not all at the same time. Right. What that happens with them is that all gets pushed. Yeah. Like at that same time. And then because of that, their fucking world crashes. What it makes me think of is like when Clint Darden was talking and he was like, all in or get out. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't agree with that. I, I, I agree. I believe there should be a balance. Mm -hmm. Yes. You want to do well, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't involve where you're sacrificing the time with your family to do this. Like you're, you're like people, they'll skip out, you know, and I think I, I, I remember, oh, what's his name? Bob from West side. Co. Bob, so yeah, Bob Co. He talked about whenever his, his husband, his son was a state champion diver and he never once saw his mm -hmm. son compete mm -hmm. and it, it brought him to tears. And I'm like, that to me is like, that's something that you want to try and avoid because mm -hmm. you can't get that back, you know? Um, so yeah, so I, I don't think it should be the point where you're all in, uh, like to where you, you move and you quit your job and you live out of your fucking car and like you're suffering to just for this, you know, for the sake of being able to squat a thousand pounds you know, because I see, I don't know if that's all in, though, right? Because well, I've had this conversation with a lot of other lifters. Yeah. And that's not really all in because your stress is so high, you know, because yeah. you're not working, you're sleeping in a car. So are you really resting well enough? Are right. you recovering well enough? Yeah. Because if, if you really did give a fuck and mm -hmm. we're really all in, you'd find a way to be able to rest more. Right. To recover more. But you, a lot of this you don't learn. Yeah. Until you get through. Where the other aspect, I think people drop the ball is they're only driven by one thing, mm -hmm. right? Just throughout this conversation, you're driven by trying to prove people wrong. That's True. one thing, yeah. right? You're also driven because you love the sport, right. right? But you're also driven because you love to be able to do this and have your family be a part of that. Right. So there's three different things that are driving you. True. Where if it's just one, mm -hmm. then that becomes problematic. True. Because the things that are driving you are all balanced because of that yeah like your family wouldn't want to come help you no if you were a shitty fucking dad true Very right true. thank you <laughs> so it, w it wouldn't be the, it would just wouldn't be the case but because of that you have their support behind you and the more people that you have behind you as mm -hmm. far as your support right even though it's just you under the bar it's not yeah right because yeah. how well would you do under the bar if you went to the meet and you just got in this blowout fucking fight with your family true right and they all fucking were pissed because you went to the meet you yeah. know they don't like you doing this right and all this other kind of stuff which can lead to that yeah if you're selfish fuck and you treat them like shit all the time well then they think you're treating them like shit because of this yeah you see what i'm saying yeah. so it's that's where i'm like i don't that all in thing yeah is very poorly defined mm -hmm. well and it becomes an excuse it does. For some people. It's like, it, I could be this fuckhead, you know, because, because I'm all in. Right. And you're really not. But I think uh, you touched on the PED thing. Um, you know, a lot of people, they jump in both feet way too fast mm -hmm. on those things. And that's something that could be detrimental, you know. Um, so, like, to me, like, if you're going to do those things, and I'm not telling you not to, I'm not telling you to do, but um, do your research talk to people, you know, do it in moderation. Well, put in the time beforehand. Yeah. But build a base. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. I mean, just because I, like, I know a lot of people think that that's just the pathway that they're supposed to take. Mm -hmm. So they, and I, I've talked to kids before, like they're 21, 22, and they're like, hey, should I do this? And I'm like, well, how old are you? Oh, I'm 22. I'm like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. I was like, you haven't even, you're not even done growing yet. You haven't even touched on what your, what your potential is. Mm -hmm. I was like, so give it time, you know, start work on, work on your base, work on your fundamentals, work on your technique, try to figure shit out first before you just immediately start taking shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might surprise yourself. Well, I think if they, if they don't do that, they limit their back end. Yeah. Right. Because the stuff helps. Mm -hmm. right? There's nobody's no going to say it doesn't yeah. help. Definitely. It helps. But if you haven't figured out beforehand what your technique should mm -hmm. be, how your training should improve, you know, all those things, you're still going to have to figure out after you go on because yeah. there's still you're going to still run into mm -hmm. sticking points. It's inevitable. With Definitely. That's where it happens. But how cool would it be if when that happens mm -hmm. and you're on, you already know how to overcome these things? No shit. It would really fucking help. Yeah. Right. Because what happens is when they don't have that first, then their answer is just more shit. Mm -hmm. 
They hit this. We've seen it. Yep. Like, so it's not like we're speculating here. This is like fact. Yeah. You know, they hit that first sticking point and they're like, oh shit, I guess I need more. Yeah. Then I need more. Then I need more. And it's like, no, man, it's not the mm -hmm. problem. Right? I, I remember a conversation with somebody a while back and I'm not going to name the person, but they were talking about they were like taking two CCs of shit and it wasn't working. So they're like, you know what? I'm just going to take three CCs. You know, maybe the, uh, the receptors aren't, maybe if I just overwhelm the receptors, they'll start receiving again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I was flabbergasted, <laughs> yeah. Because I was like, just that's just a lot of stuff, man. That's a lot of stuff to be taking. But I get it also like I, I remember, I don't know where I heard it from, but like I was like, if um, and it may have been you, maybe a conversation that you and I had years ago. But uh, like if you're a high school athlete and you choose to start taking stuff to play college ball, more than likely that's as far as you're going to go. Mm -hmm. If you get to college and you start taking stuff to get the NFL then so be it. You know, you may, you may mm -hmm. get the NFL, but you may not last, you know? So it, it all depends on when you start taking stuff as far, it's going to limit how far you go. You know, if you can, if you can get to these certain achievements mm -hmm. or levels before you start taking these things to pr make progression easier or not easier, but more attainable. Yeah. So um, it's definitely not easier. Um, then it, the higher you're going to get the better mm -hmm. you're going to be so. in some ways it just adds another layer yeah you know because you got to figure that out and it's like the multiply stuff you got to figure that out so you have training yeah then you got to figure the gear out mm -hmm. you got to figure that out. you know the peds out you got to figure the nutrition there's all these layers of shit you have to figure out yeah. it's a which, lot which takes time yeah where it's that's for the newer people coming into the sport i think that's where they get overwhelmed mm -hmm. right because they're 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 trying to figure out too many things yeah at one time. Definitely. So just focus on your technique. Like people yeah. that jump immediately into like four plies, mm -hmm. you know, and they, like it's, they're just new to powerlifting. They show up and like all of a sudden you're putting fucking briefs on them. You know, they're new to this shit. They don't understand how the, how the material works, how the gear works, what it's going to do to you. How the recovery works. Yeah. Because the, the, the CNS fatigue is like people just don't understand until you start throwing this shit on and putting a whole lot of weight on you. Yeah. You know? And a lot of people say that CNT, CNS fatigue isn't real. You know, I've heard that before, but I, oh, I'll tell you for one, it's fucking real for me, you know? So like you, whenever you throw people into the deep end, so to speak, uh, yeah, it's not going to work out in the best. Like I've always recommended to people, like you start single ply, then double ply, and then you can jump into multiply. Mm -hmm. But it's like, there's a progression to it, you know, because it allows you, if you jump in a single ply, it allows you to learn how the gear works, how it affects you, the technique of it. You know, opening on your squat, you keep your knees out open, sit into the gear. But like if and it alert, it allows you to learn what it's going to do to your body too, because if you're in this gear, it's going to want to push you forward, and mm -hmm. you have to learn to not allow it to do that, to use it to your advantage to help you stand up. So if you're a new guy and you're jumping into like metal briefs, four ply, mm -hmm. you know, it's you, it's going to be hard for you to learn that, especially if they put you in tight briefs immediately. Which, <laughs> which is why whenever I did the uh, the metal gear like i was the gear whore and helped people with sizing i would ask them are you are you new to this or are you have you been doing this for a while if they tell me they're new i would always suggest that they get a brief that's one size bigger because mm -hmm. i didn't want them struggling to reach depth and fucking everything up to where they lose sight of what they're supposed to be doing and they lose the enjoyment and the love for it and they're like fuck this i'm not doing this anymore so I would always suggest, look, you, you get a size bigger, learn to use the gear, learn how it's going to affect you, um, learn what works best. Um, once you get to this level where everything, you understand it, then you can always have it taken in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, now you got a tight brief. You don't have to go buy another pair of briefs. So these are things that I suggested to them. Um, more often than not, it worked. You know, I, I got a lot of feedback from people that would reach out to me after the fact and let me know, you know, like, look, dude, the sizing was spot on. You did a good job. Like, I understand what you were saying now, stuff like that. So like, I, I actually, and I wanted it like during this time when, with elite FTS, like, I appreciate you letting me do that mm -hmm. and be that guy because I got to meet so many people and I felt like I was giving back. Well, it helped, it helped, uh, it helped us. It helped yeah. me because we weren't competing anymore. You know, right. we weren't in the shit, right. you know, so how, how in the world, you know, can you help somebody mm -hmm. figure their gear out right. if you're not even wearing it? I mean, that's one thing that kind of like always blew my mind. Yeah. Like, you know, some 
uh, other companies at the time. It's like you're calling people that don't even train. Oh, I remember. You know, it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, it made no sense. Right. And it's, you know, it, it has to be somebody that's actively still training. Yeah. Right. And I guess if they're getting into gear now, they need to get around other people or at least build relationships with right. other people that are using the shit to be able to tell you what you're supposed to feel. Yeah. Because it's there's a lot going on with that. Yeah, there's a whole lot. It still goes back to what you just said, though. Definitely. You know, it's a little bit bigger. Right. Figure it out. Even with know. spin shirts, like I would tell them the same thing with bin shirts. You know, but I, I I love being able to interact with people in that aspect and help them do these things. Because mm -hmm. I know, like, it was like years back, you and I talked about me finding my niche. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people had things that they were good at, and like I was I was struggling to find that. Um, you know, because that was what, like whenever we kept records of like our logs of like where we were ranked, like who was visiting our 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 log most mm -hmm, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that actually that actually stems like whenever I started the the NSFW, you know, years ago, yeah. I, I did the not safe for work logs. Like I did that to try and see how it would affect my ranking, mm -hmm. and it was fucking amazing. I guess <laughs> like I started posting like booby pics mm -hmm. and like ass pics in my log, and I went from like eighteen to fucking five. <laughs> And I'm like, you guys, these are the same. You can find these pictures online. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. And like, I did that for a couple of years. And like, whenever I stopped immediately, I went from five back to like fucking 19. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. But I, I found my niche with yeah. your help. Yeah. You know, whenever you and Mike Zederick, um, and Mike, if mm -hmm. I, you know, if you don't mind me plugging mm -hmm. him, if not for Mike and him talking to you, I would have never been on Elite FTS. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate Mike a great deal for allowing me or helping me get this opportunity to mm -hmm. be part of this. Um, but, you know, um, Mike and you suggested that I start doing the, the gear whore thing and like mm -hmm. helping people size. And I loved it, you know, and I was sad whenever like the metal thing mm -hmm. went away because, it, you know, I still get questions here and there. And obviously I still help them mm -hmm. find out what size they were with. So time to take my gab at Penton. <laughs> but um it allowed me to interact with people and help people um with their training with getting in gear learning how it's supposed to be done because then they would still come back and ask me you know what should i do how would i how how should i learn this you know how long does it take to learn this and so on and so forth so just thank you for allowing yeah. me that part or that ability to be able to do that because I, I really enjoyed it and i loved it you know and i felt like it made me feel more part of the team mm -hmm. being able to do that too mm -hmm. Any other topics? Mm, just one. Actually, I got one more question too. So bring that okay. up. So mm -hmm. the one thing I wanted to do in this, like this is for JPEG. Cause uh, years ago, like whenever we used to have the Q and A there, uh, like people could address questions to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, I stole one of JPEG's questions and answered it. And JPEG called me out on it. And I fucking lied to him. Oh, yeah. And I was like, no, nah, dude, I didn't take your fucking question. I was like, the guy sent me the same fucking question. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to apologize. <laughs> Peg. Yeah. It's been bothering me a long time. I'm fucking sorry. <laughs> I, I took the question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you remember what the question was? I can't even remember. <laughs> All I know is like, I, I wasn't getting any questions. Mm -hmm. Like no one was asking me anything. And I think that was whenever we were able to look at other people's questions mm -hmm. and I saw this question that had been in JPEG's question or like in his mm -hmm. inbox and it was there for a long time. And like, I'm like, well, maybe JPEG's not going to answer. Mm -hmm. So in retrospect, I should have said, Hey, Peg, do you mind if I answer this question since yeah. it's still sitting there? And, you know, obviously hindsight's 2020. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, I just answered the question. And then whenever he called me out on it, I fucking lied and I feel miserable because he was my friend. He's my fucking buddy. So it's been weighing on me all these years. So like, this is my opportunity yeah, to yeah. publicly apologize to Peg for taking the question. Oh, I'm pretty sure he doesn't give a shit. He probably doesn't. He's probably, <laughs> he's probably forgotten the whole fucking thing, yeah. but like, it's been on my conscience. Oh my time. God. So yeah. Sorry, Peg. What are, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see lifters making now? <sighs> Trying to move too fast, too soon. Like yeah. we've just been talking about, um, not building a foundation, uh, jumping into PEDs too fast, jumping into gear too fast. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's that I want it right now mentality that a lot of younger people have, you know, because you now we carry around fucking computers in our fucking hands mm -hmm. all the time. So like the, um, 
gimme, gimme, gimme thing. Like it's, 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 a, it's at your fingertips. So it's easy to achieve. So you, you need to put in the work. You need to put in the time. Don't expect things to come to you easy. Work hard, you know, make good choices. You know, this is what I tell my kids every morning, work hard, make good choices. You know, that's what you need to do in powerlifting. It's not going to all come to you easy. And if you're forcing shit, if you're forcing what you're taking, you're forcing yourself into gear. Um, you're forcing yourself to move weights that you're not capable of just yet. You know, the fucking shit's going to, bad shit's going to happen. Yeah. You know, whether it be health wise, like you fuck yourself up inside or you fuck yourself up on the outside. Like you're blowing off tendons here and there. You're tearing biceps, shit like that. I mean, obviously, I, I'm not one to talk. Well, I mean, like, yeah, when I hear those things, I think back and I'm like, well, I did all that shit. Yeah, I know. You know. So it's like on, <clears throat> it's a tough one, right? Because <clears throat> it's now it's, I call it being on the other side of the table. Yeah. You know, so to speak, people yeah. told me the same shit. Yeah. You know, I just ignored it. Yeah, I did, you know, and I did too. To a point. Yeah. To a point. You know, I'd say in my 30s, I probably started to listen. Yeah. You know, after things, maybe that's the difference. You know, after things started to get nicked up, yeah. you know, with, with us start. as we come through, we realize maybe we should fucking listen to people. Yeah. Where before that, no, maybe that's what's not happening. Yeah. You know, as they get to that point where they start twinging things mm -hmm. and they don't yep. listen to people, they just quit yeah. or double down. But I think people are still quitting in droves they, too. They do. They quit whenever it starts getting hard. Yeah. You know? They'll do a couple of meets and like they're setting PRs, you know, which is normally going to come to people that are new to the sport anyway, because, you know, your, your body is adapting, you're growing, you're, you're getting stronger. So yeah, when you're new to the shit, it's easy, but shit, I remember like it, I had like a seven year lapse between my one squat, my squat PR and fuck, um, I don't remember when it was I pulled 720, but I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't had a deadlift PR since then. Yeah. You know, I've come close. Like I pulled 730 to my fucking knee, above my knees and it fucking came out of my hands. But that's the closest I've ever come and I've never reached that again. Yeah. When I look at gains, if you want to say gains is, is a term, the, the three biggest things that create the biggest risk gains, right? Yeah. Would be like the beginner gains and nobody's going to, I mean, that's right. just part of it. Right. So that always happens and it's never duplicated. Right. <laughs> the second thing. And I think that the second thing actually produces the greatest amount of pro progress. And that's either training in a crew or being around people that are stronger than you are. Definitely. Without a doubt. The third would be the PEDs, mm -hmm. the crew and being around people that know what they're doing far exceed yeah. any gains that would make that somebody would make on PED right. far exceed as we saw in your own case, going through your timeline. Oh, yeah. I've been soon, lucky. As soon as you get in a crew, boom, there it goes. Yeah. Like where the shit that, where'd right. this come from? Yeah. Well, you're, you, you see other people doing bigger weights. Definitely. So now you know it can yeah. be done, right? You have people that believe in you. You got spotters, you can push harder yeah. you know, all this other stuff. And yeah, I guess that's one thing we didn't talk about is like training groups. Training yeah. People surrounding yourself with people that for one are going to motivate you, you know, and that are, have some kind of a positive aspect, you know, something positive that they're, that they're pushing you. And I've been loved, lucky in that because of, of, at OBB, I had Brian Schwab, mm -hmm. you know, I had Brian Tincher, um, and all the people, John Land, you know, all these guys that I was surrounded by that, uh, that wanted me to do well. They were pushing me to do well, you know, at the same time I'm pushing them. And then there was CTX. Whenever I got there, like they knew me, but they didn't know me, you know? So like I, Alan Pilly, Danny, all these guys at CTX, again, is a great group, fucking drove, drove each other to push and do more and do better. And then now here at Storm, like I couldn't have asked for a better training group, you know, with these guys uh, and girls. Uh, like I've, like I said, I've just been lucky. Not everybody has the ability to train with these level of people that yeah. I've got. Well, there, there's three things that happen when you're in a, a group like that is there's, there should be, unless you're the top person, mm -hmm. there should always be somebody that's strong, way, you know, out of reach, right. that's stronger than you, but you aspire. Mm -hmm. Like, man, I, if he can do it, why can't I? Yeah. Then there's somebody in your same level where it's like, I'm going to beat this motherfucker. Right. It's really competitive. Yeah. Because they're close enough that you know you can beat them. Right. And so it drives both. Yeah. And then there's people that are at a lower level mm -hmm. that you're able to help, which the more that you help somebody, the more it 
it increases your own skill level. Yeah. Because you're looking, you know, bar path or whatever you're looking at yeah. to be able to fix that. And it's reinforcing mm -hmm. it in your own head. So all three of these things are kind of working at the same time. Right. Which just drives people. Mm -hmm. That's not to say somebody can't, you know, achieve great heights in their own garage, Mike yeah. Touchere, people like that. I know. But they're, they're rare. I know. It very, is. Like, very rare. Like Mike, Mike, like I've never gotten to meet Mike, but he's always been impressive. Mm -hmm. The the things that he's been able to do, like squatting well over six, 900 pounds by himself, oh, it's, you know, yeah. benching, you know, he's unracking 600, 700 pounds right by himself, benching, and then putting it back in the rack by himself. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess the only other person I can think of that does that, like is I don't know his real name, but Vanilla Gorilla, yeah, Blaine Blaine Sumner is yeah. that his name? That's the only other dude I can think of that does this. By uh, Steve Deal. I mean, he does it with multi. Oh, yeah, you're right. I forgot about Steve. That's ridiculous. And Steve's been. And I I follow Steve and I I love Steve to death. Like he's doing some weird shit. Hey, there's a whole lot of t a lot of weight on those fucking bamboo bars, man. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <laughs> so yeah, so Steve does it. Yeah, so the the guys that are able to do it on their own, you know, and make progress and you know push the envelope. Like I, I got to hand it to him because mm -hmm. like I've trained by myself in my garage like during COVID and shit, and it's just not the same, you know. It it's, it's it is it's like it it's it's different whenever you've got someone there holding you accountable for what you're doing mm -hmm. as opposed to holding yourself accountable. So yeah, any final thoughts? Uh, no, not really. Wait, have I beaten the time, Owen? Uh, three hours three minutes. So I have beaten the time. <laughs> no, you're well, you're above, so average. <laughs> you're above average. I just didn't want to be the shortest fucking table. Oh, you're not man. the shortest okay. by any fucking means. <laughs> no. Any means. Okay, so yeah. okay, so I'm, I'm I know damn well I'm not getting to five hours. No, <laughs> no. Um, any so any final advice for? Let me give you a demographic. Okay. Um, well, we'll go with what you've been doing most of the time. So it's the multiply. It's, mm -hmm. it's the smallest percentage where yeah. I want to put that out there, right? It is. It always has been, though. I mean, you know this. I know, but it, at, when, at one point in time, at every meet you went to, you'd have the, everybody, almost everybody was in gear, and you'd have, like, a few raw people here and there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's completely yeah. fucking flipped. Now. Yeah. Well, the single ply always dominated. Yeah. It by did. far it right was, so it was less expensive and easier yeah when i used to track it i would the only way you could really track how many lifters there were is you could get a hold of the federation presidents or whatever they are yeah. they would never tell you right yeah. so you, you kind of had to guess there but i would go off powerlifting usa subscriptions because mm -hmm. i figured this is going to cover most of it definitely and then add a little bit to it i and then ricky crane was Right about the same number I was is about right. twenty thousand. Yeah, is what we came up with. Yeah, and then the multiply facet was maybe three thousand mm -hmm. split between IPA and APF back and forth. So yeah, at that thirty percent, right? It's way less than thirty percent now, but it wasn't the majority. The majority was always the single ply, Definitely. right? And that's not including high school. Yeah, because that's always been ridiculous, right. you know, with the numbers there. And um, now it's predominantly raw, but then the single ply is bigger than what you think. Is it if you really? Go, yeah, if you go to open powerlifting and filter, yeah. you can see, you know, mm -hmm. it's bigger than you think. And then uh, the multi-ply. I, I haven't, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I just have I haven't seen much single ply in Florida at the meets like I'm competing at or judging. Yeah. Like it's a, it's. Well, they'll be in the USAPL. Oh, or they'll be, yeah. so you got to look into other federations. Yeah, so I definitely, you know, obviously yeah. I don't go to USAPL. Exactly. Because. You know, <laughs> yeah. So when you're going to APF you know, SPF or whatever the hodgepodge yeah. of federations are anymore, yeah. you know, it's going to be a little bit different there. So if, so the advice would be towards people that want to get into multiply, which is the smallest percentage, but mm -hmm. that's probably where the least amount of information is. Right. If they want to get into it, um, as you kind of mentioned earlier, they're jumping too fast. Yeah. You know, so the final thoughts for that demographic and that, that demographic also includes the older people because yeah. you start to get a little beat up. Definitely. You find the only way that you're going to be able to continue to do this. Is to find some support. Is to find some gear. Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, I would try to, my suggestion is to try to find a group of people that you can train with that are, have used gear or still use gear um, because they're going to have the outlook or the information that a normal person isn't going to have. You know, you can't, like you were talking, we were talking earlier about the person that's training with raw lifters, like they're moving to go to a gym to, but they're going away and want to learn gear, but there's nobody there that trains in gear. So if you have the ability to try and find 
someone that uh, that has a gym or has a group of people that you can train with that uses gear, that would be the ideal situation to be in. Not everybody can do that. Um, so if that's the case, try... We have people that visit Storm all the time. So we'll have people that will travel just to spend like the weekend with us or to spend a week. We've got a guy, Nick, who just moved... Like he moved to Daytona because he, he works remotely. So he moved to the Daytona area simply to train with us because he's Danny is doing his programming. So Nick actually moved down to train at Storm with us so that he could learn how to use gear. Uh, so if you're able to do that, if you work remotely and you are able to make a move just for a short period of time to train with people just to get some kind of knowledge about it, then again, that's going to be the ideal situation. If that is not something that you can do, um reach out to one of us it does i know there's there's a lot of people that are willing to help you know um look at look at your look at your training look at how you're using the gear bar path technique stuff like that there's a lot of us out there that are willing to help you out and we're not asking for anything in return you know be for one like i don't i don't mind it when people send me things and uh you know i'm and i may get a lot of questions now because i'm saying this but I don't care. Like I want to help, you know, I, I, I want people to do well. So I, and I know that Danny has, is willing to help, uh, Anthony Oliveira, you know, Bob Merck, you know, these are, these are guys fucking Travis McKinney. You know, these are guys that are just, they, they know how to use the gear obviously because they're putting out big numbers. So these are all guys that I know that are willing to help people. So, I mean, if that, if, if you can't train with a group, or you don't have the ability to move somewhere or travel somewhere to train, then reach out online. I mean, the, the, this wasn't available to us whenever we were younger, when we were doing this, like we had powerlifting USA, you know, we didn't have the ability to reach out online and say, send somebody a question, you know, but that it's available now, fucking use it, you know, reach out to people. I mean, there, most of us from what we talked about in powerlifting, it, we're all there to try and help one another. Mm -hmm. There's very few selfish power lifters that you're going to run into. I'm not saying that they don't exist, but most of us are willing to help and we're not asking for anything in return. We just want to see you do well. All right. I'll wrap this up by thanking you yeah. for being a representative of Elite FTS for almost 20 years. Yes, sir. I mean, it's it's humbling, you know, to look back yeah. and think that we've been doing this for fucking 25 yeah. years 26 years or whatever it is you've been with us for almost 20 fucking years so we're doing something right yeah. you know we may not be the fucking biggest yeah you know but we're doing something right and it's because of people like yourself that as you just noted are willing to help other people out yeah. i mean it's the whole aim and vision of the company from the right. very beginning Live, learn, pass and it on. still continues you know today yes sir and if it wasn't for people like yourself and others i don't know if we would still be around yeah you know well, because that, that you know that message is it it spreads mm -hmm. right and i don't believe it's being lost as much as people think it's being lost yeah. because it still is out there yeah and it's available and you know the time that you put into helping lifters through the phone through the q a mm -hmm. and all the other stuff i mean it's when we took down because we didn't really take it down it just kind of dissolved <laughs> it didn't well the q a part i mean it's facebook kind of killed the yeah killed that and then the training logs kind of got waxed with instagram but we had it close to a million questions Holy shit. in that database i didn't realize that, that were in there a million files yeah think about that yeah. that's a lot of fucking yeah. questions it's a lot of you know <clears throat> what can I do if I don't have a reverse hyper questions? Mm -hmm. Probably like a 200,000 of all that, right? But <laughs> <laughs> we don't get that shit anymore. But that was like the number one question for a long yeah. time. But you guys are taking time, you know, out of your own day mm -hmm. to be able to help these people out, which is what kind of built and solidified, you know, the aim of the company mm -hmm. and the and what we have. So I want to thank you for that. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate um, it. And keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And we're done. Do, well, yeah. One, yeah. do you remember there was a while back? Do you remember you calling me because you had heard like I was worried that I was going to be cut from the team? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Like, I think uh, Joey Smith had called you and we were talking about how like he and I, like we would log on sometimes and our fucking password wouldn't work. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And like yeah. you called, like you were like, Joe, I, was, I heard you were worried about being cut from the team. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, who told you that? Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, it stemmed from that. Cause there were times like Joey, 
and I, we, we used to talk a lot. We don't talk as much anymore. And it's mostly my fault because mm. I'm, I'm not much of a phone guy. Um, shit. I think I've talked to you on the phone three times mm. in the last 16 years, but, uh, like Joey and I would talk. Cause like, if I logged on to post my log and my password didn't work, I would call Joey, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, Joey, is your password work? He's like, yeah. I'm like, mine fucking doesn't work. I was like, I wonder if I got cut and I just don't know it yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so that, I didn't know if you remember that story, but I thought I would share that real quick because at one point in time, like I was always concerned, like I, yeah. was, I was always worried. Am I doing enough mm -hmm. to be part of this? Yeah. Because this was so important to yeah. being part of this team. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, guys, we're done. All right. Thanks guys. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tea that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tea that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star tea, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically just pop the pad on the bar, reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. All right, guys, if you like the Table Talk podcast, then you're going to love the crew. If you're struggling with trying to get through a sticking point, you're trying to figure some specific aspect of your training out that you just can't dial in, you're dealing with injuries, you're trying to figure out how to better optimize your training, all the stuff you're seeing on social media is confusing, and all you need is a little guidance and support or just somebody to look at your lifts to make sure that they're either heading in the right, right direction or if there's a weak point in the lift, they can point out what that weak point is well that's what we have the crew for so when you join the crew you get an extra table talk podcast each month called the crew cast you also get access to our discord community which has a training q a form checks with top coaches mindset section nutrition training logs programs over 30 ebooks plus exclusive ebooks just for the crew webinars lectures seminars giveaways from ranging from full strength equipment. We've given away many yoke bars this year. We've given away actually pieces of strength equipment as well as accessory items and you get exclusive crew discounts. So go to the link in the description that says join the crew, click it, join now and start getting stronger today. Elite FTS was founded in 1998 with the aim to live, learn and pass on. We've done this through training related content, that allows you to become the strongest athlete and coach that you can. Over the past two decades, actually two and a half decades, we've published more complimentary training media than anybody else in the industry. When you look at the number of articles, the Q and A's, the blogs, the videos, the podcasts, there's over a million pages of content that we've put out there. We've been able to do this through your support of Elite FTS. So when you purchase Elite FTS strength equipment, bands, accessories, gear, apparel, or anything through the site, you directly help support the content that we put out, which in turn helps support other people on their journey of becoming stronger and better coaches. So stronger athletes and better coaches, which encompasses the aim and the vision to live, learn, and pass on. So I thank you for the support that you've been giving for the past 25 years and encourage you to keep supporting Elite FTS into the future so we can all help more people become better and stronger. Discount code TABLETALK for 10% off your first order.